Recording in progress. Good morning, honorable members. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I'm just making certain I'm heard. Good morning to everyone, all of those who have joined us, to the honorable members. This is a meeting of the Portfolio Committee on Health to hear representations from the Public Service Accountability Monitor, the South African Disability Alliance, the South African Federation for Mental Health. We would be hoping to finish by 1300 hours uh, today. I want to take the opportunity to thank you, honorable members, for having agreed to us continuing the work today. And uh, I also welcome all of the other people who have joined us uh, at this meeting. Ms. Majalamba, can you just uh, give us the attendance and apologies, please? Good morning and thank you, Chair. Present is Dr. Jacobs, Ms. Demunyai, Ms. Keller, Mr. Sokaja, Dr. Harvard, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Ishmael, Dr. Tembekwayo, Ms. Chirwa, and Mr. Van Staden. I've received an apology from Mr. Sheikh Imam. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, now remember, um, Members always have to read this, just to remind you that this is a virtual meeting and that it is deemed to be in the precinct of parliament. And it therefore constitutes a meeting of a committee of the National Assembly for official purposes only. In addition to the rules of virtual cities, the rules of the National Assembly, including the rules of debate apply. Members enjoy the same powers and privileges that apply in a sitting of the National Assembly Members should equally note that anything said in the virtual platform is deemed to have been sent to the House and may be ruled upon. All members who have logged in shall be considered to be present and are requested to mute the microphones and only unmute when recognized to speak. This is because the microphones are very sensitive and will pick up noise, which might disturb the attention of other members. When recognized to speak, please unmute your microphone and connect your video. Members may make use of the icons on the bar at the bottom of the screens, which has an option that allows a member to put up his or her hand to raise points of order. The Secretariat will assist in alerting the chairperson to members requesting to speak. When using the virtual system, members are urged to refrain or desist from unnecessary points of order or interjections. We must also be reminded that after the presentations by these uh, three groups, we will also have to adopt some minutes. We are very up to date with our minutes, thanks to our committee secretary, Ms. Majalamba. And then we'll have a few uh, short discussions on honorable members on um, a couple of reports which are outstanding and when we will be doing these as well as when we will be resuming with uh, the work of the uh, NHI public hearings. So with not much further than that, can I then welcome um, the first group. Uh, Ms. Majalamba, I don't think it's necessary to flight the agenda unless I had now missed anything in what I had just alluded to. No, there's no need, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So let me welcome the representatives of the Public Service Accountability Monitor. I do not know who is leading this delegation, if, but if that leader can introduce his, him or herself and then also introduce the rest of the team. And after that, we can go straight over into receiving the presentation from them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee for having us. My name is Sugiswa Kota. 
Um, I will be uh, undertaking our submission from the Public Service Accountability Monitor. Um, I think my colleagues are, are not joining on the on the Zoom, but will be listening in on online. So they're making use of the um, parliamentary channel to 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 listen in. Um, yeah, so that it'll just be myself. <clears throat> you are very welcome, Ms. Kocha. We appreciate you coming today. Feel free to just continue. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I trust that my um, presentation is is uh, already visible. Um, I yes, it is. Right. Thank you. Get right into it. Um, as I've mentioned, I um, my name is Zugiswa Kwadaya. I work at the PSAM, which is based in the Eastern Cape, and um, I my role there is uh, as a program uh, lead for our work in South Africa. Um, our presentation today, I, th I think we'll try and focus really on the areas that uh, we feel are, are best uh, emphasized rather than to, to perhaps uh, speak to the, the exhaustively speak to the submission. Um, we'll also do our best to um, avoid uh, duplications. I'm, I'm fully aware of the committee um, and the, the various the numerous sittings. Um, so this is the presentation outline. Uh, we'll speak just very briefly about the organization so, so members know who we are. Um, and then focus primarily on uh, the governance and organizational structures aspect, the access to information, procurement, uh, and procurement in particular, those aspects of the submission. Um, and you members will note that we aren't going to speak to the exclusions aspect, but just point to the section in, in the written submission where it exists, um, given that I, I believe this has been discussed at length um, in, 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 in preceding submissions. Our organization uh, is, was established uh, some years ago and is based at uh, the School of Journalism uh, at Rhodes University. We work in, in uh, six countries and the, the work that I lead is of course focused on South Africa and this is an area of interest for us. We are particularly engaged in the parliamentary space because we uh, understand the link between uh, key aspects of public resource management um, and socioeconomic issues and the responsibilities of the executive, but on the other hand, the, you know, the important role that um, oversight entities um, like portfolio committees have in this space. And so this is really why we are here. Um, in our work, we acknowledge the complexity of, of, these, of these issues, societal issues and PRM failures, um, and how they interrelate um, on the realization of human rights, uh, health being a, an area that we have uh, focused on over the years. Um, I, I think I won't speak in any further depth about our work, but if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer those about how we work and, um, and our, our areas of focus and, and advocacy. The governance and organizational structures, perhaps just to say to members that the, the contents, are, I'll try and flag where in the written submission um, I, I, I'm speaking to, but the, our governance and organizational submission Contents are on pages three to nine of, of the written submission. And I'll really touch on just the core aspects um, and not go into too much depth, except I, I will go into some depth on the procurement aspect, which I believe um, hasn't uh, been discussed as much perhaps. In relation to the governance aspects, we find that um, on the one hand, the NHI has a, a really important role to play in implementing in its implementation. Um, but that uh, the provisions should be implemented in a, in a manner that promotes accountability um, and that the mechanisms introduced should allow for increased transparency and, and systemic responsiveness within the healthcare system. Um, the our principles that, that have uh, informed our input in, on this section are also about the recognition that there's a need for the, the NHI or the, you know, to support more effective, efficient, equitable and inclusive access to health services. As things stand, uh, we find that the bill simply has insufficient consideration of the existing systemic um, issues and the existing governance failures that we've seen within the health system. Um, we also note that some of, some of the aspects raised or the reforms uh, indicated in the bill are likely to replicate those weaknesses um, and are also themselves likely to fail because of those existing dysfunctional uh, aspects and the weak governance mechanisms. Um, we also emphasize that the, there is a need for health system strengthening of, of health system management um, in itself, um, which should be factored in. 
In terms of the, the organizational structures proposed, um, the, the governance or the decision-making processes that are introduced in, in the bill need to be better for framed and, and more clearly framed in order to enhance um, implementation that in itself should improve governance and, and health outcomes. Again, as things stand, that, that is not the case in, in, our, in, our, in our reading of the bill. And so we, we also endorse other civil society organizations' inputs, which we've noted and, and have highlighted in our own submission, um, in, particularly those from Section 27 and TAC, who've indicated that the bill gives the, the minister, as things stand, too much power um, on the one hand, and on the other, inadequate um, independence is afforded to, to the board of the fund, um, which for, for accountability and, and um, governance issues is, is a fundamental problem. So for the details in terms of that, uh, the, as I've noted, there are sections that I won't go into, in, in, into detail on, um, but rather indicate the, our proposals or our, our, uh, the principles that have informed our input. In relation to access to information, um, and that's in detail within pages nine to 11 of our written submission, um, I think it's important to foreground the provisions of section 32 of the constitution, which effectively recognizes all our rights uh, to access uh, information held by the state. And for us, I think to reiterate uh, a point perhaps that is quite obvious <laughs> to most is that on the one hand, um, you know, where high levels of transparency, um, you know, proper transparency uh, exist, good governance and accountability are well supported. On the other hand, um, where access to information is restricted or where opacity and opaque decision making is the case, corruption and maladministration thrive. And so the, the, the issue of access to information throughout um, the bill and in particular in relation to the fund um, is, is a fundamental weakness um, in, in our estimations. Added to that, um, we emphasize that there, there is a need also to ensure that there is timely access to information, um, particularly now public access to information about aspects of the fund. Um, this has the potential of increasing meaningful participation um, in, in, in important processes, but also of creating a greater and deeper awareness of um, the provisions of the bill, provisions of the NHI and the fund for everyone and anyone, which really is a fundamental aspect of public participation and awareness. This is a, a key gap or a key weakness um, as things stand. We also note the importance of the ability to, to provide feedback regarding services offered. Um, and, and again, it's not just in relation to the, to, the, to the health system. In fact, I think more broadly, when we talk about the delivery of public services. And so we encourage the drafters and, and others who are talking about you know, the reforms as they stand and, and the, the kind of next iterations of the bill to take guidance um, from the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency's principles of public participation, particularly when we are considering access to information um, prior to enacting the proposed legislation. So the gift principles, while they really are focused on fiscal policy, we find that they are applicable in the context of the NHI and the fund. And um, I won't go into detail, but there's a, a little photo there of, of key, 10 key principles that, that they propose should, should um, be considered in, in, in fiscal policy in particular, but the, there are definite um, applications or in, in this instance. I'd, I'd like to move on to um, the procurement, um, and perhaps I will at some point come back to um, the governance structures. And in fact, there, there's an aspect of it that I really felt and I think my colleagues would be disappointed for not emphasizing it, but if there is time, I'd like to come back to one aspect of the governance, which, which I omitted in, in, in earlier. But however, in relation to procurement, this is an area for us that is increasingly uh, an area of, of importance of focus, an area um, you know, that, that links quite fundamentally to all aspects of, of public affairs, to all aspects of um, um, service delivery. And the, you know, People are entitled to fair, equitable, and efficient uh, public processes. Uh, the you know, public system should be that way. We, we also you know, emphasize that the responsible stewardship of public finances and expenditure, as well as the, you know, the diligent delivery of rights-based public services is where it you know, should be vital and should be a consideration central to procurement. Um, and so one of the things that we believe 
is is a is a thread at this point linking various reform processes, not just within the NHI context, but in the broader public procurement context, um, is the recognition that procurement is a necessary strategic development um, instrument to promote not just good governance but the delivery of services to people. And so it should embed um, effective and efficient use of public resources um, and, and ultimately increase levels of service delivery. Um, we, we also would like to emphasize that the importance of procurement in, the, in, in this bill um, in establishing a transparent, fair and prudent um, health sector procurement system, which as it is a weakness where it stands, and we would like to just um, really touch on it with, in our submission. Perhaps just to also reiterate or emphasize why else we think procurement matters. Um, in, in our most recent uh, uh, reports, we've, we've heard that an estimated 27 billion rand, which is the equivalent of a third of, of the current uh, health budget, um, is lost to corruption every year. In September this year, the Special Investigating Unit reported that 14.8 billion of COVID-19 expenditure uh, dating from April last year to June was being investigated for procurement irregularities. Um, and while, of course, that isn't just in the context of, of health, um, it, it is a response that it has very central, you know, um, health delivery aspects to it, given, given the response to COVID-19. And so we encourage the committee to consider aspects of the, the, net, the draft procurement bill, which was tabled in, in um, 2020, um, in as far as the broader reform questions are concerned, as well as to consider parallels between the proposals in the, in the NHI, in the bill, and structures that are proposed in the procurement bill. Um, and primarily given, and I think it is an opportunity, we emphasize it's a very important opportunity given that the, the somewhat the overlap um, of, of both processes. So I'd like to refer the committee to page 12 of our written submission, um, which, speaks to uh, in, to some detail on, on aspects of procurement. One assumption that we really feel is a risk that is made in the bill um, are the contracting structures in that the districts and departments are given the requisite or there are assumptions made that they have the requisite technical or human resource capacity to fulfill the supply chain management demands that the fund will introduce. We know that this isn't the case, and, and, I, and of course the committee is well aware of the capacity constraints, when, particularly when it comes to management of contracts, um, not only in health, but in really across the public service. And so we propose the inclusion of SCM, supply chain management experts, within the stakeholder advisory committee in order to provide critical guidance, particularly during the inception stages of the fund. Um, of course, the timelines we note um, have been what they've been. Um, our, our friends and other CSOs have also noted, and, and we, in fact, in, in discussions, we, we noted and we've, lift, we've um, included it there, um, a proposal about what, you know, how to structure this. Um, and the suggestion is that the minister must, after consultation with the board and by notice in the Gazette, appoint a stakeholder advisory committee as, as one of the advisory committees of the fund. The committees shall, shall comprise of representatives from the statutory health um, professions councils, health public entities, supply chain management experts, um, organized labor, civil society organizations, and so and so forth. Um, but here, the, really, the emphasis is about um, the, the expertise required to support, meaningfully support um, the provisions that are proposed. We appreciate as well, uh, and we've moved to page 13 of the written submission, we, we appreciate that centralizing procurement uh, can have these significant uh, benefits, which include really meaningful cost savings. Um, the National Treasury and the, and the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer outline a range of benefits of centralizing um, such processes. And we've listed them there, and I think they are worth repeating. And they include the elimination of unnecessary duplication reducing leakage and ensuring better utilization of scarce procurement skills. Again, this notion of, of scarce skills in this sector is emphasized and, and um, is something that is worth foregrounding. Reducing the administrative burden for suppliers, resulting in policy cons inconsistency, inconsist providing an opportunity for long-term um, supplier relationships and certainty in the marketplace, 
we note in education, for instance, that um, its supplier relationships are, are a major limiting factor. Reducing the administrative burden uh, government has with repetitive quotes, which could have been directed towards contract. And lastly, allowing government to, to refocus on contract management. And again, that, that this notion of, of um, efficient management of, of public procurement contracts. And so we, we are concerned that these benefits that are listed as potentials for centralization are not likely to be reaped um, under this, the current conditions or the specified conditions within the bill. Um, and, and not all of which are, are currently, or rather not all of which are met by the, the health system as it stands and as it is in reality. So the bill envisions that centralized control of at, at the national level um, with the assistance of the district health management offices. Um, and, and this limits, we, 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 we feel limiting um, administration at the local level of control and creates a distance between the site of implementation and where the supply chain management decisions are fundamentally made. And so in a context which, in which communication and administrative integration between national, provincial and district uh, entities has been notoriously weak, we, we really emphasize that this will have the effect, the effect of increasing those inefficiencies within the system, um, potentially increasing delays. Uh, so, you know, delays in the delivery of items and services and so on, um, potentially increasing the costs of doing business um, and, and ultimately um, really creating procurement backlogs, which as we know, um, have really sort of fundamental life and death access to health um, uh, implications. The, the other um, aspect, the bill that, that we emphasize is that the bill currently provides for multiple structures with overlapping and, and often undelineated responsibilities, which we feel is a risk uh, of duplication of duties and increased human resource management and governance challenges. Um, health is a complicated uh, context in some respects. And so what is proposed in the bill is not helpful. Um, and so while legislation to delineate the roles uh, um, is contemplated in, in section 31.2 of the bill, um, which had I not skipped over it, I'd have spoken to. Um, concerns have been raised um, in the submission, uh, in, in our written submission in, in detail that relate to the challenges that the, the bill in its current state are likely, current state is likely to create. And so the governance aspects link quite uh, significantly to the, to the envisioned procurement um, aspects. Um, in, in terms of section 22 of the Medicines Act, um, the, the Minister of Health has gazetted a list of scheduled substances um, and, and the Minister is also required to formulate regulations on the introduction of a pricing system that is transparent. And again, this notion of transparency comes through um, and includes a single exit price, which uh, must be the only, and I'm quoting verbatim, the only price at which uh, manufacturers shall, set, shall sell medicines and scheduled substances or any person other than the state, to any person other than the state, excuse me. So we note that even though the, you know, the sales of medicines and scheduled substances uh, to, to private purchases must be at a single entry price, which, which um, is important. The same is not true for, for um, sales to public entities. Um, this price is open to negotiation and, and is unregulated. Um, the bill uh, envisions that the single price exit at which uh, medicines are to be uh, sold will be prescribed by the Office of the, of the Health Product Procurement um, as, as uh, outlined in section 32. So raising this point is, is significant because that would mean that the price of medicines to which the single exit price did not uh, previously um, supply now has now should be, should be included, excuse me. Um, and taking into account the requirements of the Public Finance Management Act, um, as well as the Treasury regulations and the, the procurement regulations, those requirements for openness, for fairness and transparency it isn't quite clear to us how the arrangements uh, within the fund would then meet these requirements uh, where the price of medicines will not be open to negotiation and, and fixed at the single exit price. So that is uh, an area of, of um, uh, inadequate clarity for us. And, and again, an area where lack of transparency potentially would, would be um, uh, uh, deleterious to the 
objectives of the bill. Um, we also emphasize a concern, which is that it isn't clear what um, Im impact this would have on competitive bidding processes, which, which has been indicated as, as an important aspect um, of, of the tender process. We've seen wh where competitive uh, processes are, are, are turned upside down, the implications of that for public funds. Um, we also don't see um, what this would have on the tender adjudication and evaluation processes. Um, and so clarity on the pricing mechanisms is really, really important um, over and above the precise sort of tender procedures that the funders should be should follow. Um, and so there are sort of detailed proposals that that we've made about that. What I'd like to of them emphasize um, in the first instance is really again the aspect of you know the ability to have oversight and, and, and monitoring um, through the involvement of non-governmental actors, uh, civil society and others within the procurement process. And we can talk about the, the, the feasibility of this. I know when in, in other discussions related to involving NGOs or non-government actors in procurement, uh, there have been concerns raised and, and perhaps we can talk about that. Um, we've also seen credible research that indicates uh, that maladministration and fraud within SDM processes could be limited through the involvement of, of other stakeholders. Um, at the moment, the procurement system uh, requires an establishment of three bid committees. Um, we've seen research that, that uh, encourages or rather recommends that the involvement of, of non-government actors um, in at least two of the three processes. Um, so the evaluation and adjudication stage, which again is about transparency and openness. And we feel that this would ensure or, or, or better ensure or you know, increase the chances um, of more open governance practices and, and um, really bolster the aspect of public monitoring. Aligned to that, um, and this is an area of, of work for us that uh, is, is, is uh, growing, is, is the suggestion of implementing uh, more e-government and open data portals uh, or platforms to support health procurement. So again, this open, this aspect of openness of information and publication um, on public platforms that are easily accessible. Um, this, you know, South Africa is a founding member of the Open Government Partnership. Uh, President Ramaphosa at the time uh, was in fact the first, if I'm not mistaken, to lead uh, the partnership um, as, a, as a country um, representative. Um, and this is an important uh, commitment and the, the bill, should seek to respond more directly to South Africa's commitments, um, in, you know, to openness, to open government um, <coughs> outlined in the, in the action plan. Um, I'm almost at the end. Um, and so we also propose that aligning tender information or tender data um, of, that comes from the Office of the Chief, or the rather that is housed at the OCPO's e-tender um, portals and central supplier database um, so there needs to be alignment between the two in order to ensure access and centralization really of that data access to it. Um, and, and again, this is about not only publication of uniform data standards or, or publication of data, procurement data and uniform standards, but also that it is easier or becomes easier to follow um, health contracts um, from planning stage right up until impl implementation and see all aspects full cycle um, you know, access to information relating to procurement within the health sector. Lastly, um, yes, that is indeed lastly. <laughs> um, this is just uh, if you, relating now to the inclusion uh, on, on relating to section 38.3, still on procurement, which speaks to, uh, the, again, this aspect of contracting and publication. Um, and read it verbatim, provide the public with online access to all contracts concluded by the Office um, of Health Products Procurement, provided that such office redacts um, those, those portions of contracts that are subject to protection affor afforded by the Promotion of Access to Information Act and the Promotion of Personal Information Act. Um, really, there is then in this instance a need uh, to, to adjust the transitional arrangements, particularly in, in, in relation to the first phase um, of, of, of implementation, um, which would recognize uh, the need for a process of accreditation of healthcare providers 
which must also require that health establishments are inspected and certified by, by the Office of, of Health Standards Compliance. And we feel that all of these um, aspects that relate to openness and transparency, that relate to governance, that connect to um, better, better alignment, better communication between the different levels um, of government will really go a long way towards creating a, a system of open governance uh, and, and where monitoring of procurement decisions and, and implementation can be better. Um, the health system, as we've seen, is a, a site of misuse, uh, particularly where it comes to corruption or well, tenders. My, my apologies. Um, and, and we won't perhaps go into too much detail. Finally, the section on exclusions, we've chosen not to um, go into much detail on that, as, as I mentioned earlier, given that uh, colleagues have spoken to this at length. But it is uh, uh, tabled before the committee on pages 16 to 22 of our written uh, submission. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, of course, that too is on the table for any discussions or areas of, of clarity. Um, I had indicated that I'd skimmed over um, in, in error um, the details in the section of um, governance, uh, but, but perhaps I'll stop there for now. I haven't kept a close enough eye on, on my time, um, Chair, but uh, I'd be happy to, to go into detail in question and, and discussion time. Yes, you're very welcome to complete that section. You, I should have reminded you that you have 45 minutes to present. Okay. So that you're still very welcome to complete it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it really, um, yeah, so thank you for that. So going back to the governance and organizational uh, structures um, aspect, I'd like to go to page four of, of our written submission, um, which, which looks at section 36 uh, of, of the bill. This section uh, really makes it clear um, that the DHMOs so the district health management uh, officers will be established as national government uh, you know, uh, responsibility areas. And the proposed, their proposed introduction will result, we find in, well, in significant reforms to, the, to, to provincial health services. Um, and this includes the removal of provincial or provinces powers to amongst others plan, manage and develop uh, human resources, as well as to control and manage the cost and financing of public health establishments and agencies. Over the years in our work, and, and I hadn't mentioned that an area of focus has been the health sector um, and in particular provincial uh, aspects. And we have quite closely looked, for example, at uh, the health sector in the Eastern Cape over several years. And, and in our work, we've raised concerns with systemic governance and accountability weaknesses, uh, particularly and as far as they relate to um, the management of human resources um, you know, of personnel and, and personnel arrangements, um, as well as of, of budgeting and, you know, financial management and, and, and health services in, in general. Each of these are, are really important in as far as provincial competencies and, and, and capabilities are concerned. Um, and in, in, the, in, in health departments in particular, we, we found um, how these relations or these processes have impacted negatively on the delivery of health. So the weaknesses in each of those areas, um, whether it be in expenditure management, whether it be in aspect of um, integrity management. So, um, you know, the extent to which uh, decisions that are not in the best interest of, you know, the, the service delivery or of the public, decisions that are counter to the, to the um, provisions of the constitution or decisions that are counter to the provisions of the Public Finance Management Act, for example, within the health sector. Um, the extent to which those are, are, you know, there are consequences for those is has been limited, and we've we've um, done quite a bit of work in this area. So what we've noted is that um, there is also differences in in how departments, different provincial departments of health um, function, um, and and there are different, you know, different levels of weakness or strengths in 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 various departments. So the bill has a sweeping and very, uh, you know, in, in its sweeping and drastic reduction to provincial uh, hospital services um, and the transfers of many of the mandates to the national department, to the fund and to the district health uh, management offices is risky. Um, and our 
our position is that the, these, these risks are primarily about the potential or the risks of further decline in the delivery of services, um, given the problems or the issues that we've raised, um, particularly noting that in the transitional, uh, and this is, I mean, the health system, as we know, is, is a massive system. So in the, in, the, in the extended transitional period, or in the transition period, these will be particularly messy to kind of use a colloquial, you know, um, colloquium. Colloquium, colloquialism, colloquium, getting stuck in my own head. Apologies. Um, and so the what what are so our concern is that the proposed transfers of these mandates um, has serious risk to an already um, under underperforming and substandard um, system. Um, in this regard, we also include that. So the significant shifts in mandates could potentially have a negative impact on the working relationships between the provincial and national um, you know, government, uh, as well as to present significant cooperative government challenges. Um, that would be in conflict, we feel, with what is outlined or envisioned in, in chapter three of the constitution. And so this would further, we find, you know, have the impact, of, you know, adverse impact on the delivery of health services. There are complexities, intergovernmental um, complexities that I think the bill uh, does not take into, into adequate cognizance. We, we also note that section 31, uh, two of the, of the bill requires that the minister uh, must clearly delineate in appropriate legislation, the respective roles and responsibilities of the fund and the national and provincial departments in order to prevent duplication of services and wasting of resources and to ensure the equitable provision um, and financing of health services. Very important. But considering that the significant reforms that are proposed in the bill, um, as well as the government, the governance and decision making processes and complexities that, that are going to be introduced, um, as well as, and I think this is a point that is, is worth making, um, as well as the potential politicization of those processes, of those arrangements, um, we, the, the, we, we think that the, the legislation to delineate these roles and responsibilities really is, 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 an, is an urgent matter, is one that shouldn't be delayed and shouldn't be observed as a secondary aspect to, to the provisions of the bill. So if anything, um, this, this information should itself in detail already be included um, in, in the bill as it stands. Uh, again, uh, it, this should not be a, a secondary consideration. It would also then uh, provide the opportunity for kind of closer scrutiny um, of, of the potential implications. Um, and so we propose that section 36 of the bill would, could be revised in a manner that creates a mechanism that allows for reform and transition that, that doesn't again, doesn't have an adverse um, impact on, on the current levels of service delivery. So primarily um, preemptively avoid the, the, those conflicting um, situations and, and, and um, that, that, as we've noted. Um, and this is particularly, we note, within the context of provincial health services um, that have displayed, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, a track record of progressive improvement, uh, but, but again, a differentiated one. The section should introduce, we, we uh, propose uh, a phased approach for the creation of these offices, the DHMOs, um, particularly once the cooperative governance milestones have been reached or identified, um, or it, that is a much clearer understanding of what those would be. This potentially um, would require a revision to the proposed, uh, at that point, new clause, you know, 31A of the, of the National, National Health Act which may introduce some complexities, we note. But those are areas for us that are certainly, in, in, as the bill stands, uh, are, are assumptions that really place risk um, ultimately on, um, on the bottom line or on the objectives of, of, of the NHI itself. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I'll stop there and, and really just reiterate our gratitude for this opportunity to engage with the committee, particularly noting, um, you know, that the, the, I think what is amazing, the influx of submissions and the interest from the public, um, but certainly, yeah, thanking you for the time and, and the attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Scotta, for the presentation.
we are going to look at which members had uh, raised their hands. I do have some on my system here. And I'm going to be reading them in the order which they will be posing some questions to you. First is Honorable Ismail, followed by Honorable Harvard, Honorable Sukacha, Honorable Gela, Honorable Siwela, and then Honorable Munyai. In that order. Thank you very much. You may start. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Honorable Slengwa. And Honorable Slengwa would be number seven. Last one, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you Chair. Good morning, Chair, and good morning, everyone, once again. Thank you for the very, very, uh, you know, uh, appropriate uh, presentation. Uh, I just have a few questions. Now, my first question, under the bill's current governance and organizational structure, in your opinion, what is the state of risk for corruption and how strong are the accountability measures in the bill? Uh, my second question, to what extent does the bill allow for equal access to quality health care? In your opinion, is this an all-inclusive bill or much more needs to be done to make it all-inclusive? My third question, how sustainable is this bill in its current form, in your opinion? And my last question, considering the massive cost the bill will bring, would it stifle innovation in the healthcare sector? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the presenter. Does PSAM differentiate between strategic opportunity and procurement as poor the definitions in the bill? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Good morning to the presenters. Uh, <clears throat> let me also take this opportunity and welcome a report from the presenters. Chairperson, uh, just two questions from my side. The first question is, in light of all the issues of concern which uh, have been raised by the presenter, May I inquire as to uh, uh, the PSAM's uh, view regarding the timing of implementation of the NHI as a strategy to move towards universal coverage in South Africa? Put differently, Chair, my question to the PSAM is whether the move towards universal health coverage mm -hmm should not be implemented until all the issues raised are addressed. May I get PSAM's uh, reasoning behind the uh, <clears throat> response to this question? Then, Chairperson, my last question um, is uh, on section 36 of the bill. Uh, PSAM uh, make reference to the fact that the current model of service delivery should not be disrupted. Is PSAM satisfied with the access to quality of service and that the status quo should remain? Thank you very much, Chair. Next is Honorable uh, Gela. Honorable Gela. Honorable Gela is not available. We'll go to Honorable Siwela. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairperson, and greetings to colleagues in the platform. My, my question to Sam, that the presenter appears to believe that transparency in pricing, a single exit price for medicines and negotiations cannot coexist. What informs this view? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Is Honorable Gela available now? If not, Honorable Munyai. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Chair. 
I must say, not the first question is that the, based on the presentation of the presenter, I get a view that this organization, PSAM, are against everything, if not most of the proposal made in the bid. Could they suggest perhaps that PSMA would rather retain the status quo in our healthcare sector? If so, why will that uh, be given the challenges? Uh, I would like to believe we are um, all aware of which rel of, of what relate uh, to the lack of inequalities in the current system and lack of access for good quality of healthcare for all our people or to the majority of the users of the healthcare in South Africa. I also want to ask the question, if P PSMA are against Minister of Health as an accountability authority, consistent with the democratic outcome and the structure of our government, of unitary government, who do they suggest should handle, should be held accountable for implementation of the NHI, uh, the content of the NHI? I want also to ask the following, uh, Honorable Chair. In the presentation of the organization, you, you really indicated lack of transparency uh, and in, inadequate governance and accountability as issues of weaknesses in the bill. At the same time, the minister is executive accountable for certain aspect of the bill. I, I however, missed your, um, your recommendation on how this should be addressed in your view. Can I please get some clarity on your proposal on how these weaknesses should be addressed? Lastly, Honorable Chair, the, 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 the organization or the NGO was trying to, seems to make rec recommendation on the changes of the PFMA, which really cannot be done through the, the, the NHI bill. It can be done through the finance. If you want to change all the structure, the structure of the, of the procurement system. You don't do that through the NHI bill. There's a bill because all supply chain processes are regulated or formulated through the, the PFMA. So if you want to change that structure, you don't come to NHI bill, you go through that particular bill and change it. Because I don't think, I think it's irrelevant to attempt to make recommendation of the changes of supply chain uh, of PFMA through the NHIB. Uh, maybe if they have a view, they'll clarify this point. I think this is misalignment of presentation so far as supply chain is concerned. Regardless of how much money has been spent uh, in procurement, how many, how many um, uh, investigation has been done by the uh, SIU. But I must also ask, you know, uh, what is their view of the NGO that are funded by, uh, by foreign uh, organization to undermine the policy and sovereignty of the Republic? What is their attitude in that context? Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, if I may proceed. Chair, can I ask those questions of Comrade Gela? I think she has sent them, some of them to me. All right, let me just- Hey, Chairperson, Oh, she's back, she's back, she's back. Okay, let me get the order right, please. So it'll be Honorable Gela, followed by Honorable Flengua, followed by Honorable Wilson. Honorable Gela. Yes, Chairperson. Um, sorry, I've got a network uh, challenge. I'm not going to put my video on. Uh, I've got um, Manbulele as uh, to give a presentation here with us. Um, I'm having a few questions that I want to ask. 
the first one, uh, as the presenter, has highlighted uh, perceived gaps in the bill. What is the view of the presenter in these gaps being addressed in regulations? Uh, the second one, uh, Chair, um, on access to information concerns, are uh, these not addressed in section 34.2, which states uh, that uh, Protection of Personal Information Act 2013 and the Promotion of Access to Information Act uh, data must be uh, accurate and accessible uh, to the department and the fund or to any other stakeholder uh, legally entitled to such uh, information. Uh, the other question, uh, if uh, PSMA are against Minister of Health as the accounting authority, who do they suggest should be held accountable for the implementation of the uh, 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 contents uh, of the NHI? You have highlighted uh, a few areas that of a uh, concern, uh, namely procurement access to data and a uh, governance. Is it your uh, a, 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 a contention that uh, the public uh, procurement bill will address issues around uh, preferential uh, procurement uh, procedures and good governance, as well as the PMFA will address your concern around accountability, uh, procurement and governance uh, practices. Are you also uh, contending uh, that in the case of information data, are you in uh, agreement that the uh, PO PI Act against uh, others will give a guidance on how a certain information is accessed and that uh, the National Health Act as well as a Consumer Protection Act and the a consti a Constitution, including Chapter 19 of the NHI Bill, uh, further address your concern around governance matters uh, sufficiently. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable Klengwa, uh, followed by Honorable Wilson. Thank you, Chen. First of all, let me welcome the presentation, which was a very informative presentation. Mine is not a question, but a clarity seeking question. First of all, NHI, you said NHI must be implemented in a manner that promote accountability. Need on that. Secondly, you talk about instruments to promote governance, to promote good governance. In that way, we need to elaborate on that so that we get a clear understanding. And you also said we should increase oversight and monitoring. I don't know whom are you referring to?
Did we miss you, Mark Lenguak? Are you back? Honorable Lenguak? If uh, you cannot reconnect Mark Lengua, you can send your message, your question to me, and I will read it for you. Thank you. Any other members who want to raise any questions? I'm covered, Chairperson. Thank you. It's me, Thank Honorable you very Chair. Much. It's me, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, Chair. I've been waiting. My hand was up. Oh, have I not given you a chance yet, Honorable Wilson? Please continue. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to, for the presentation we've received today. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, in principle, my, a, a lot of my questions have been asked, but I just want to deal with the procurement and the, um, the single purchaser um, proposal that government becomes the single purchaser of, of, of uh, medical resources. Do you find that concerning? Um, I most certainly do, because there is such a thing as competition, and we have a competitions board to monitor that. Um, and regardless of whether or not there is a PMFA or, or any other structures in place, we have seen these being constantly overridden um, and, and being overridden by, by people as high as, as, as ministers. Um, how is this going to affect the average or the general medical um, supplies? Um, there are obviously very big companies and there are obviously small companies, but they all contribute to the economy and to the medical um, services of this country. Are we at risk um, of eliminating some of these businesses if we go with this, the single purchaser requirement as laid out in the NHI? Um, I think that would be very problematic. Thank you. Thank you, Maslengwa. Are you back, Honorable Maslengwa? Yes, I'm back. Please continue. That is typical case that said. Yes. Let me finish my question. You said yes, the increase of a size. Hello? Continue, Maslengwa. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Can hear you. Increase oversight and you can hear me? Yes, please continue. Thank you. Increase oversight and monitoring. Let me get clarity on that. Whom are you referring to or you refer to the committee or to the department? Oh. Lastly, could you talk about support and effective, efficient, equitable, and inclusive to assess health services? Let me get a clarity on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, honorable members. I have two questions I would want to just raise to the presenter. One is that uh, we, we note the concerns they raise with regards to corruption. But hopefully she's uh, aware that Section 20, subsections 2E, establishes an investigating unit within the National Office of the Fund for the purposes of investigating complaints of fraud, corruption, other criminal activity, unethical business practices and abuse, relating to any matter affecting the fund or users of the fund. Now this clause and uh, in particular, combined with the SIU led anti-corruption forum and mechanisms for preventing corruption. Are these not indications of efforts at uh, anti-corruption? And then, um, <clears throat> Do you support the establishment of a single fund or fragmented uh, multiple funds? Does PSAM subscribe to the concept of funds following functions? And if, and if it does, uh, what do you propose? Uh, how do you propose this to be structured uh, if you support the establishment of a single NHI fund? Thank you very much, honorable members. Those are all the questions which were asked and raised. I'm going to allow yeah. the presenter. Honorable Chair, I raise my follow-up. 
Thank you. On the platform okay. and also. Th thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, uh, Honorable Chair. I want to ask the question, is the presenter aware that open code, the implementation of the NHI is underpinned by Vision 2030 of the National Development Plan or the NDP, which invested that by 2030, everyone, every South African, must have access to equal standard of care, regardless of their income, and, and that uh, a common fund should be uh, enabled equitable access to healthcare, regardless of what people can afford and how frequently they need uh, to use a, a service. Or are you comfortable with the current status quo of the two tier system? which really perpetuate the inequality of care according to who have how much money in the pocket. Thank you. Ms. Kota, you're very welcome to reply to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I, I will do my best to, to be comprehensive. Um, I've tried to also group some of the questions, uh, you know, to some extent, according to themes. So I'll, I'll do my best. But if, if there are gaps, and, and I also, I think, would need to defer to some of my colleagues as well, and perhaps come back to the committee on, on any questions that I might, I'm currently unable to answer. So, um, and also perhaps to say, I did miss where I did miss uh, who asked a question, please, please do forgive me, but um, yeah, let's go. Um, perhaps as to begin with, um, the, mostly because they speak to the, the, the ethos and the principles that underpin our, our input, I'll, I'll begin in, by answering honorable, sorry, I actually, want to find specifically um, honorable to leave these questions, my apology. Um, I think primarily because many of the questions that um, you, the honorable member asked uh, were, were in some respects reiterated by, by others. I think it would be a major disservice to my organization and, and colleagues to not really emphasize this. Um, and I think perhaps if in my presentation it came through to the contrary, we are very much in support of the implementation of the NHI. Um, the principles that underpin it are central to what we believe are fights and efforts to reduce and to fight inequality in this country. Um, central to our work has been precisely the work to um, contribute to eliminating those gaps um, and to, in particular, uh, close, close those inequalities. So, so Honorable Chilizzi, I think uh, I do value your question and I think, uh, you know, the, the kind of frank uh, question about are we wanting to perpetuate the same levels of inequality and have the status quo continue? Absolutely not. That would be devastating. And I think given all that we have seen and given all that we know, um, the reasons that we make the submissions we make around the NHI are not to detract or to close it down, um, but rather to strengthen it, and in particular, to strengthen the provisions within it that will better ensure that we do meet um, our SDG, you know, the, you know, SDGs and to meet the demands of the NDP and to make sure that you know, Agenda 20, 2030 is a reality um, in as far as those inequalities and in particular in relation to health. So I think I would really like to emphasize that. And, and if it was uh, you know, an omission at the beginning of the presentation, it is that we want to support the NHI, but it also is that um, the provisions that are weak for us are those that are likely um, to see us in 2030 talking about an unequal health system and a two-tier system. So I really felt to begin with, with that. Um, and Honorable Chiliti, again, your, your point about are we against everything and are we wanting to retain the status quo? Absolutely not. Um, there are certainly really positive aspects of the bill, but we felt that in our submission, reiterating uh, the, the positives perhaps what was, was uh, 
it is important to, to acknowledge the importance of the bill and acknowledge the positive developments and, and those aspects that um, are great about it. There is much that is great about the bill, um, but we felt that perhaps speaking to the weaknesses, um, what was, um, yeah, it's important in terms of the reform process and, and improving, hopefully, improving its provisions. Um, are we against the minister? And I think this is a question that was also, if I'm not mistaken, asked by Honorable um, Gela. Um, so I will answer that and hopefully Honorable Gela will also be, be answered in that. Um, absolutely not. Um, the, the, the structures, the powers and structures that are um, aligned with the constitution and, and within um, you know, the executives, uh, you know, the ambits of the ministerial powers are, are not what we're questioning here. What we are questioning, however, is the extent of power um, that sits within the minister as things stand. And for us, that is problematic as, you know, as the structures are. The, and, and, and perhaps to reiterate as well, the aspect of the um, board and it's at what we are saying is inadequate or insufficient level of independence. We have seen um, what it means in various contexts within the public service when a board, um, you know, when a board is, is unable to make you know, decisions and is inadequately um, provided with the powers and responsibilities in order to affect um, you know, fair decision-making in a sense and proper oversight, but also to implement consequence management when necessary. And so those for us are the concerns. Um, and, and we've outlined as well, and, and I think we've also made reference to um, you know, extensive submissions about the proposed or alternative structures to that. So um, perhaps to reiterate the point, it is not that we feel the minister does not, you know, does not belong um, as an accounting officer in the context of the NHI, but rather um, that um, the, the powers as things stand assume in a similar way, well, perhaps, yeah, let's maybe stop there for now. Um, so no, it is not to turn to turn the, the powers of, of to rather to reject the minister in the role of, of accounting within the NHI context. Um, the, sorry, perhaps now to, to go backwards. Um, I missed um, the honorable member's name, apologies at the very beginning. Um, I was only seeing the hands not, um, the, the question around the state and, and the risk for corruption as things stand, and perhaps that will link um, to, to honorable Jacobs's questions. Absolutely, I think the structures or the provisions as they stand, um, and perhaps I will answer at the same time, anti-corruption provisions that are, that are currently outlined in the bill are important. And I think that is an area, uh, you know, that um, we want to foreground as a positive area. And absolutely, those we do recognise those as efforts or anti-corruption efforts, um, particularly um, the the investigating authority aspect, um, as as it is. However, um, what we are, what for us is is of um, concern are, are again the structures and and perhaps to speak directly to the aspects and, and the proposals that we've we've made around that and the arrangements in relation to um, the governance and oversight aspects. Um, Honorable Senga, I'm, I'm hoping that this will also answer your question about, um, you know, that it may not have been Honorable Senga, I apologize, but certainly there was a question about um, oversight over whom, monitoring of whom, um, and and Absolutely, monitoring and oversight of the processes of procurement, monitoring and oversight of the delivery of services in the context of the NHI. Um, and I apologize if it came as if I was uh, talking about monitoring and oversight of the committee, um, just to clarify that question. The, the context of competitive bidding and in, in the procurement space, um, I think that is, a, a, from Honorable Wilson, an important question. And in principle, the provisions um, within the, you know, the PFMA, the provisions within, um, you know, Treasury regulations, the provisions even in the context of the draft procurement bill um, that relate to the role of the state in procuring services and procuring goods and services is fundamental. So for us, um, as things stand, we aren't questioning that the state should be um, responsible for procuring, you know, within the public service, but the provisions as they stand are not in support of adequately providing for competitive bidding and perhaps that is where the concern is so we certainly aren't um, advocating for for the uh, state to for you know the state to 
relegate um, its its procurement duties. Um, I believe that that yeah, there there are complications in that, and it certainly isn't an area of you know it isn't something that we would um, advocate for. But as things stand again, I think um, if the amendments or the or rather proposals that we've made aren't considered, or at least aspects of them, which include the you know the aspects of including within um, the 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 um, committee, for instance, um, external actors. So within the bid adjudication process, I'll give an example. Um, we have seen at least one instance in which within the procurement context, um, the inclusion of, um, you know, as non, the inclusion of non-government observers within the process um, of um, bid evaluation and adjudication is an, a, a potentially quite valuable um, additional layer of accountability and transparency. Um, and so those are some of the kind of submissions or some of the suggestions that we are making rather than to take away the, the, the procurement um, competence or procurement responsibilities from the state. They do belong with the state. Um, the, the, the question relating to um, Yes, so, so perhaps yeah, back to the question on the NHI is not the space to advocate for procurement reform. Um, it belongs within the PFMA and uh, you know, outside of this space. Perhaps to, to emphasize the, the submission that we, we've put forward is not speaks to specifically the procurement arrangements in as far as the NHI is concerned, rather than uh, you know, given, given the details within the bill. And so it is not that we are advocating for, in this instance, reform of the PFMA, certainly not, or reform of procurement more broadly, but rather for the considerations around, for example, the different structures, um, the expertise and the capacity issues to be taken into cognizance in the context of the NHI. Um, and the, the assumptions that are made that are inherent in the bill we find are likely to replicate the same procurement um, you know, irregularities, um, oversights, and so on um, that we are currently seeing and may not be an adequate improvement of health procurement as things stand. So, so perhaps to, to, to note as well, the reason that we then raised um, the parallel systems of reform that are happening in the draft procurement bill and the NHI context is not to say that we believe that the Portfolio Committee for Health or the Department of Health or the NHI has a role to play in that space in terms of reform, but rather that those should be complementary processes and have complementarity in as far as the reform agenda is concerned. Um, and so we are seeing, we made a submission, for instance, to the National Treasury on the draft procurement bill, which in itself has many fundamental problems. Um, and we have noted that each of these processes does, does not seem to be speaking to one another. And for us, when we're talking about uh, reform more broadly, it is about public finance management holistically. So yes, observations about procurement in the NHI, we feel very much belong within the context of the NHI and, and the discussions about how to improve that to ensure that the you know, aspects of quality, equity, transparency, and, and so on are, are met. Um, and so really it, it wasn't to say that it is for the NHI to make uh, those reforms, but rather that the existing provisions are, are not sufficiently um, are weak. The, and I apologize, my, my answers are all over the show. My note taking was all over the show. Um, I believe this was Honorable Chiliti on the foreign funded NGOs undermining the sovereignty of South Africa. Um, I, I, do, I do feel it is important in any context, particularly where there is engagements between um, oversight entities, between parliamentary committees and outsiders like ourselves, for us to, to be open about you know, our mandate, our agenda and who we are. And certainly in this instance, um, I, I'm not sure where the question is coming from, but you know, um, I do not believe that there is necessarily a link to independently funded organizations um, who have a social justice mandate and who want to see the betterment and development of our, our, our country and the, you know, the sort of doing away of inequality, for example, and poverty and unemployment. I do not believe that um, the, the funding uh, of those by foreign donors um, necessarily means that uh, you know, submissions such as this or context such as this are opportunities to, to kind of undermine the sovereignty of, of decision-making of governance um, in South Africa. So um, I would be happy if there are kind of particular questions around that um, to answer, but perhaps just 
yeah, um, it, it was maybe a, a broad uh, question in itself. The There was a question um, from Honorable Shengwa as well about the implementation to promote good governance and accountability. Um, and uh, the, the question was how, how to do this. Um, I think in, in essence, uh, each aspect that we've raised is about increasing accountability. So for example, um, by ensuring uh, a more broader, a more uh, diverse set of actors in the, in the context of the procurement uh, process, for example, is one way of, uh, of shoring up or bolstering accountability mechanisms. Uh, it's, it's, not a short, it's, it's not a guarantee. Um, by ensuring, for example, that um, you know, there, there is um, adequate communication lines and, and mechanisms between the different uh, pro you know, provincial entities district and, and national is another way um, of promoting good governance, particularly recognizing the existing processes or weaknesses in governance um, within the public sector. Um, the, the proposals we make, for example, that relate to um, the delineation of you know, roles and responsibilities more clearly directly within the bill are also about shoring up those accountability um, and reporting processes. Um, and so for us, the the what runs through or we you know certainly hope runs through our submission is precisely you know how recording in progress site of influence or or um consideration so for example on page eight of our written submission um there, there are some proposals that we've made um that perhaps if if i could direct um members there i think some of the questions that came through um are answered in those in 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 that particular section so um Yeah, and are carried over, in fact, onto the next page. So I won't read them in depth, but certainly to say that on, on that page are some of that. Um, there was a question as well uh, in relation to access to information. Um, and in, in fact, what was raised in, in our um, submission, I feel uh, in relation to section 34.2 that was raised by the honorable member is, is indicated there. Um, and I'd point perhaps to, you know, nine um page nine and onwards of our proposal and in fact the, the the particular proposal we make um in relation to um the requirement of the fund to establish an information platform is that and and i i'm trying to avoid going into too much detail but, but yes, I think it is helpful. Scott, i'm about to remind yeah. you you're two minutes over your time so if you can start okay. wrapping up those answers thank you okay so so perhaps i i think that was honorable thing or uh, I, I think who asked the question about access to information, or um, but if I, I could direct you to pages nine and ten, uh, ten in particular, where we go into detail uh, in terms of proposals for for how we think that should be, um, and really I, I do note that there's many questions I haven't answered, but perhaps we could I could uh, come back to members in writing on those, um, particularly around. Some of the structures questions um, and perhaps it just is a case of noting where we have made those specific prop um, proposals within the within the written submission um, I'll, I'll i'll stop there um chair but I, I think it's just to really finally reiterate that um by underlying under under outlining the kind of fundamental issues or problems that we think feel are fundamental problems it is not to to um, subvert or to close down the process of this NHI um, development. We feel it is important. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important process, but rather, again, it's to strengthen the current mechanisms and, and provisions made. Um, and it, it, there are questions that uh, perhaps I can answer in the chat or in writing around the sustainability and, and how we feel about that, the questions that we asked at the beginning, um, the extent to which um, you know, it will allow for you know, it will meet its its obligations or its mandates. Will it stifle innovation? I, those were very you know questions I was hoping to get to answer. But maybe just to really um, quickly to say no, we should not delay um, you know implementation at all. NHI is important and must continue. Um, do you want to reiterate the status quo? Not the innovation question is a, is a, is an important one. I'll maybe share in the chat. Um, and I unfortunately I, my line broke a bit when Dr. Harvard asked her question. So. 
Um, I, I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, but perhaps you could put it in the chat and I'll, I'll try to answer in the chat if that is appropriate, Chair. Yes, thank you very much. So you're very welcome to reply to, to uh, in writing some of those which you haven't been able to answer. You can send that to the committee uh, secretary, Ms. Marja Lamba, and we will certainly have a look at those. Thank you very much for coming, Ms. Kota. Uh, we appreciate your presentation. And we also appreciate your um, answers to the various questions raised. And so before I let you go, maybe a last word from you. <laughs> no, nothing from me to except to say thank you very much. And perhaps just to note, this is, um, we very often tend to make submissions to the Finance Committee, uh, me in particular, the Finance Committee and Appropriations Committee, and um, not accustomed to this length of time. So normally we get five or 10 minutes. Um, and so this has been quite a, a unique experience in terms of the length of time afforded to the deliberations as well and to the input and very grateful to the committee for this time. Um, I do hope that you'll, yeah, um, to kind of we will keep a keen eye on the processes. And again, to say it, it is an important process and an important space for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks Thank to all the you. members. Thank you. I can see you're quite used to it now. I understand why. But yes, we are very lenient. <laughs> yeah? The people in the health space are good people, so we give you a lot of time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Have a nice too. day. You're welcome to stay on, or you, or you could possibly leave if should you wish to do that. Thank you. We will now continue, honourable members, with the next presentation, and that presentation is by the South African Disability Alliance. If the member who is present or the leader of that alliance is present, if they could please indicate who that is and introduce their team, and then also to continue with their presentation. Uh, yes, Chair, thank you very, very much. I am present. My name is Kelly Duplessis. I see for some reason my camera is not working. I foresee it is because I dropped something on my keyboard. There we go. Um, my name is Kelly Duplessis. I am, um, generally speaking, the founder and CEO of Rare Diseases South Africa. However, today I make presentations on behalf of the South African Disability Alliance, who is a consultative forum with about 20 members um, in the disability sector. I would just like to say that the views um, presented in today's presentation are not entirely my own and they are obviously representative of that consultative forum. If possible, I would like to share the presentation. If yes, you can do you have just... any other members with you today? I believe that the Secretariat of the organization, Ms. Milani Liver, is on the line as well. Milani, if you can confirm. Yes, I'm here. And then also we'll be joined by um, our Vice Chair, Mrs. Bronwyn Ward. Thank you. You're all very welcome. You may continue with your presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. If you can just give me one second to get it, get it going. I trust that it has come up and that it is all visible. Yes, it is. You may continue. Thank you very, very much. Uh, so firstly, if we can, we'd like to start with regards to our concerns on the definitions that have been put forward um, and just the, the general sentiment that the initial draft bill, um, there was a lack of, dis uh, lack of consultation with regards to the disability sector. And what we do appreciate the opportunity to be able to, um, you know, to deliberate um, in this particular forum, but that was generally the consensus um, around the sort of first bill. Um, we do feel that the bill as it stands does not list disability in the list of definitions of terms, and we would obviously like to see that amended as we do feel it is an important inclusion to make. Um, the, NHI, the NHI fund with regards to chapter three um, does mention disability interventions, and we feel that disability has kind of been con um, placed within the essence of primary health care, and we feel that it needs to be expanded beyond that, as obviously many elements with regards to disability, to, to disability um, and the lives of a disability patient are more advanced and often more excessive um, with regards to simply just being um, a primary health care concern. With regards to Section 12 um, and Section 25 and Section 26, 
all of which refer to the various, the boards, the benefit advisory committee, the stakeholder advisory committee, we would definitively like to see inclusion of our sector in that regard. Um, and as it stands at the moment, it is not clear whether that is A, allowed or B, possible. Um, and obviously because of the fact that we feel that any elements of healthcare should be done within the constraints of having patient inclusivity and that no decision should be made about healthcare without the patient voice present, we do essentially feel that the inclusion of the disability sector on those various committees is absolutely necessary. Uh, with regards to information platforms, it must ensure accessibility in terms of deaf, hearing impaired, blind and visually deaf, blind, etc. So that is an important, um, an important, a very, very important element for us is that any communication platform around NHI or any accessibility in terms of patients being able to um, access NS NHI elements need to ensure that accessibility has been included and that the uh, various accommodations um, will be made. With regards to major concerns around um, the bill as it stands at the moment, and generally I would like to reiterate that this position is coming from our opinion of the existing healthcare system. It is our understanding that NHI is intended to reform our in our current healthcare system and obviously bring about improvement and more inclusivity in the move towards universal healthcare. However, as patients within this community at the moment, um, we are currently seeing um, a lot of corruption and mismanagement within the department. Um, we've seen a, a vast amount of medical legal claims against the minister with regards to negligent and malpractice, which um, in the birthing process often resulting in the likes of cerebral palsy. Um, and it's, it's important for us to note that when we make these presentations, we are doing it with our understanding and our experience within the current system, understanding what we would like to see within the reformed system and not really getting much of an understanding with regards to how NHR will bring about that reform. So I just want that to be noted if possible. With regards to how the NHR will be funded, we feel that further clarity is required in this regard. Um, that it is not quite clear. While we do have some element of how this will be funded, we are not entirely sure, um, taking into the context of the existing budget and how limited that is and how little it seeks to do, we are not entirely sure how the new intended NHR budget will actually improve or allow for the expansion of services, um, particularly for the entire sector, uh, taking into account it will absorb largely um, the private sector as well. Um, we are seeing at the moment an enormous shortage of healthcare workers, um, estimated at approximately 83,000. And this is obviously now, um, this was at the time that we made the presentation and the representation. It has likely possibly changed in the presence of COVID. We know that we did in the first and second wave lose a fair amount of our healthcare workers to COVID. And um, that is a massive issue with regards to um, accessibility and, and simply being able to have enough capacity within the system to be able to provide the services required. In our sector in particular, we do see an enormous shortage in terms of rehabilitation services, um, therapeutic personnel like physiotherapists, occupational and speech therapists are really, really undercapacitated at the moment, and we do not see much reform in that sector with regards to the new bill. Lack of collaboration and resources with regards to the Department of Education and the Department of Health to address the matter of the disabled children currently not attending school. Um, as the school health program, as it stands at the moment, is inadequate. And again, this is we understand that NHI is particularly a healthcare issue, but um, we need to understand that the, the particular children and even in the employment space. Um, the patients that are impacted with um, disability are needing to be to be seen in a multitude of sectors and we'd like to see um, some reform in terms of the collaboration um, between those two sectors in terms of bringing those um, that reform to place. Um, with regards to SAPRA, um, these are issues that have been obviously well ventilated previously and we obviously have seen already there has been significant changes um, with regards to the software processing ability, et cetera. But 
understanding that new applications um, at the backlog of existing applications and the new applications at the time of writing would um, take a ton of time in terms of evaluating and, and removing those. The stockouts of medication and long waiting periods continue to exist. Essential psychiatric medication is currently not included on either the prescribed minimum benefits list and is not readily available in the state sector as it stands. Um, we have ineffective record keeping, and this pertains not only to claims um, and uh, patient records, et cetera, but simply the likes of, um, you know, administrative systems, which we see has a negative impact on patients being able to access services. Um, persons with disabilities are continuously, we see them sent away repeatedly, and they are referred back into the private system where um, obviously funding is ish problematic, particularly as the disability grant as it stands is quite low. And the result of that is these patients are essentially not receiving the services. And we would like to see those sorts of, um, that sort of reform brought about within the NHI. And again, as per the previous speaker, we are not, we are all in agreement that the reform is necessary. We agree that NHI is necessary based on the premise of universal healthcare. Our issues rely on how it is currently being set out and structured and the lack of clarity um, in that regard. With regards to the sole purchasing of medication and procurement, um, and this is also something that was uh, that has been well ventilated now with the previous speaker, it is obviously a, an issue for us um, in terms of the fact that understanding our community often requires high cost therapies, um, access to health uh, medications and uh, diagnostic tests, as well as um, devices, et cetera, that require health technology assessments and are very, very costly. And our concern is that with the centralized procurement uh, system, we are unclear how we would make applications for those. And, and furthermore, that there would actually be the budget available to pay for everything. Understanding that the budget is the budget and it, it cannot fill every single gap, we just want to be assured that there would be space um, specifically for those high cost technologies to, to still be included. Uh, with regards to the assistive devices, there is currently a ridiculously long backlog. Um, we are seeing things such as children needing to be reassessed for proper seating every six months. That is the guideline, but we are not seeing it implemented in practice. Um, other assistive devices that are named, um, such as white canes, braille sticks, etc., those are currently not um, provided for um, sufficiently in the existing system, and we are not seeing those changes there. Um, current mobility devices and posture support systems, which are currently on tender, they are completely inadequate and they do not cater for the special needs of persons with disabilities. And, and a lot of work needs to be done to, to make sure that this particular sector is provided for and that understanding that this sector will have much higher needs than the average, the average healthcare issue or the average healthcare user. We would like to see clarity with regards to an, an assurance with regards to um, the NHI that they will be the space and the mechanism for these highly um, specialized skills and services. With regards to state hospitals, um, we are still seeing a shortage of medication, staff, linen, and other resources. The extremely poor administrative systems result in loss of patient records, resulting in tests being um, undertaken more than once, um, people waiting and actually passing away while they are waiting for medical assistance um, and lack of infection control, et cetera. And those are simply some of the issues that we are seeing at the moment. We would like to see how these plan to be resolved within the, the existing um, bill. And we, we're not um, entirely sure, or we're not entirely confident that these sorts of issues will be addressed. Many state hospitals are under administration. We would like better understanding on how the NHI would turn this around and what, um, what will be implemented within this that would make these, um, these processes better. With regards to alternative treatments and research, we understand that in the disability sector, there are a lot of patients who are requiring advanced and alternative treatments with regards to things like ketogenic diets, uh, vagus nerve stimulation, neurosurgery, cannabis treatments, et cetera. We would like to understand are those included within the system? Because as we read it at the moment, we do not see that inclusion. Um, 
with regards to rehabilitation, as I have mentioned, there is in a, an adequate rehabilitation at the moment for spinal cord injuries and those requiring strokes, etc., those requiring alternative um, multidisciplinary rehabilitation. And we haven't seen any massive changes in terms of reform um, in that regard within the new system or with the proposed system. With regards to disability training, we feel that this needs to be an integral part of not only the medical personal curriculum, but across the value chain and across the, um, uh, the supply chain as well um, within the service industry. And we would really like to see improved um, understanding and training and sensitivity around the, the advanced needs of the disabled community within the NHR, understanding that there is certain accommodations that do need to be made. Um, things like uh, with sensory disabilities, you know, sign language, lip reading, um, autism friendly consultation rooms, etc. Those are the sorts of things that from our perspective, we feel if they are included, we need further clarity on how they'll be included. But we also need to understand that they have been included because that ultimately will lead to a reform system from our perspective. We need further clarity on how NHI will accomplish the following, and, and I know that this is not an opportunity for you to, to give us information um, on how the NHI will accomplish that, but it's more for us to, to put forward what our, our limitations or the limitations that we are currently seeing, um, how that will be resolved. Um, we are seeing people without um, home addresses or without ID books, we'd like, we'd like clarity within the new system, how those members would be accommodated. Um, members who present with the NHI card will be allowed three visits with their, uh, with their chosen um, clinic or GP, but how will traveling outside their district be accommodated? Um, understanding that we are, you know, we are movable beings and we're not always in the same place. Treatment without referral to private facilities will be penalized and paid for from their own pocket. Further clarity in that regard is required, specifically when we take into account that there is a deficit in the existing system and many of these services are currently procured in the private sector. In the event that we are now uh, pushed into using the NHI system, we'd like to understand how external procurement will um, impact, impact the, the, the end user at the end result. Um, there are also no clear guidelines as to persons with disabilities and their families from rural areas that they would be assisted when referred to one of the state hospitals um, and what happens in the need of accessibility, uh, accessible transport and accommodation. Will those um, be made available within the new system? There should be a specific fund allocated for disability as well as rare conditions. And this is something that we feel is incredibly important within the fund. Again, understanding that Rome was not built in a day and it's, we're not expecting to get everything that we need immediately, but we'd like to see us moving towards that. And in order to do that, we do definitely feel that a specific um, a portion of funds needs to be ring-fenced with particular allocation for, um, for high-cost treatments, as well as the disability sector who are needing um, mobility devices and, and specific interventions. The Employment Equity Act, um, will there be inclusive employment with regards to this um, employment package? Within the network, we would like to see that individuals who are disabled will be able to um, also, you know, be employed within um, the framework of the NHI. Um, then, furthermore, how will the NHI rectify the situation and provide efficient and sufficient healthcare to people, patients with intellectual disabilities. disabilities. And I, I mean, I need to mention, obviously, the life is a domain issue um, where we saw the impact of not having um, a specific and set out um, mechanisms in place has negatively impacted patients. How will the NHI address the current substance abuse situation? This is obviously something um, we do see high levels of substance abuse in patients, um, particularly with um, various disabilities, et cetera. We see lots of depression and mental health impact. And we really need to understand how those sorts of issues will be addressed within the NHI. And we're not, we're not seeing that information coming through clearly. With regards to um, our conclusion, I would like to say that once again, the, the spirit of how we present today is not one of um, criticism. 
it is with working together um, to try and find a system that has been appropriately reformed and that we've left no patient behind in the process. We applaud the South African government and acknowledge the, the massive task ahead with regards to reforming our existing healthcare systems. And we certainly agree that we need change and um, that the proposals on the table need to be examined and we need to establish workable solutions with the, with the idea of inclusivity and obviously working towards the premise of universal health care to ensure that all patients are ultimately able to receive what it is that they need um, and what investment they require in order to be able to allow them to be um, completely you know, integrated within our society today. And uh, we obviously want to see them living good and healthy lives as, and understanding that they require a vast amount of investment in order to get us there. We hope that, um, that the submissions that we have made will remind um, those that are working on this reform process um, of, the, of the nuances that we see within our sector and, and that we've provided some clarity with regards to the existing issues, which may have not necessarily been considered or just not top of mind when um, the existing bill was drafted. So that is it from our side. We'd like to say thank you again. Um, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Kelly and your team for that presentation. There are some question, uh, members who want to ask some questions. I'm going to name them one by one. So it's Honorable Munyai, Sukacha, Chirwa, Howard, Tembakwayo. Any other members? You can shout here. I see, I see uh, Siwela. So I'm going to... Honorable Slengwa, so I'm going to repeat now. That's yeah. Munyai, Sukacha, Chirwa, Harvard, Tembakwayo, Siwela, Slengwa. Any others? No others. I will ask again later. You may. Raise your questions in that order, honorable members. May I proceed? Yes, honorable Munyai. Th thank you very much indeed for this opportunity. I think the challenges that Kelly Duplessis would have raised, be it life as many be it the lack of address by our people demonstrating South Africa being a most unequal society, the challenges of the queue shortages of medicine, some of them were procuring ingredients uh, beyond the borders of this country, are the fundamental reason and why urgently national health insurance need to be expedited, need to be implemented. That is the fund that those challenges represent the need for fundamental policy reform in the form of the NHI, so that all our people, all our people, when I'm saying all our people, including those with disabilities, have access to healthcare regardless of their socioeconomic status, income, and so on, rather than the current two-tier systems, which really uh, present perpetual inequalities. So that is the reason. So my question, therefore, uh, Honorable Chair, are as follows. My first question is that uh, Kelly Duplessis' organization have identified several shortcomings in the quality of healthcare systems. The word quality appears more than 30 times in the NHIB. I'm sure uh, her organization, uh, Kelly, should have read 
this bill in details. I repeat, the word, the word quality appears more than 30 times in the NHI bill, suggesting that it addresses this problem. For example, section 10.1, section point, section 10 1K state that the function of the NHI <clears throat> is to ensure, open code is to ensure that the care services provided, providers, healthcare establishment and suppliers are paid in accordance with the quality and the value of services provided at every level of care. Close quote. Is this not indication that the NHI is a vehicle to improve the health of care systems. The second question therefore that I need to put forward before your good self is as follows. You are concerned about the lack of consultation. It's of a great interest. The process of developing NHI policy reforms started in the early 1990s 1990s, it, is ga it, it gained momentum again in 2009. The white paper on NHI, uh, which forms the basis of the NHI, was widely consulted. And so was the bill, which was published for comments for six months. Um, were you able to submit your comments? I say this because most of your comments are bound are about service provision. There are not issues of, for inclusion in the bill. If I look closely in details, and I'm sure you are aware that most of your comments are about service provision. There are not issues for inclusion in NHI bill, so far as my observation is concerned. I must say, um, Lastly, lastly, the, the issue, uh, the SADA has raised more concern around the referral system proposed in the bill. Is the recommendation from SADA suggesting that persons living with disability should be excluded from the referral system requirements? If that is the case, may I get some clarity how SADA see this different system working, uh, and most importantly, how, how can these systems can be accommodated in the bill? Lastly, by the way, some of our doctors in the hospitals that we are raising these challenges are doctors with disabilities, are persons uh, with disabilities, which means therefore, even in the employment, in the quota systems, even if the percentage could be about three, two, and so on. But they're there. They are even in a medical service, a healthcare system. The people with disabilities are there as active players. They're not necessarily excluded. That will be my view, uh, my submission, honorable chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable chairperson. <clears throat> And let me also thank Kelly for the presentation. Um, just two questions from my side, Kelly. The first one, you, you have indicated that uh, people with disabilities should be represented in several NHI structures. We have repeatedly heard that various constituencies should be represented on the NHI structure during these hearings. Will these structures be functional if the bill added all the suggestions, suggested constituencies? Is that not better to ensure that the Department of Health consults with all stakeholders annually as per the Health Act? Then my second question, Kelly, I noted that you have raised several concerns regarding the quantity of services to be provided 
under the NHI. The NHI bill does not in, um, internalize service, services to be delivered, but defines comprehensive services as healthcare services that are managed so that to ensure, to ensure a continuum of health promotion, disease prevention, diagnosis, treatment and management, rehabilitation and um, palliative care services across the different levels and sites of care within the health system in accordance with the needs of the users. Does this not clearly according to you, uh, uh, to you cover uh, your concerns? Thank you very much, Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Honorable Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm having connectivity issues. So if you're unable to hear me, please uh, just, just cite if that is the case. Um, but firstly, I want to thank Sada for their presentation. Um, I think their contributions are actually very pivotal in the direction of the discussions that we should be having about the NHI bill. And I'm primarily raising this because some of the issues that they are raising, we've, put, we've been raising as primary concerns in relation to the NHI bill. And I see you also noted on the referral system. Now the implications of the referral system are actually much more dire for those who are living in township areas and those who are coming from rural areas because they don't have the liberty of having a med forum just down the street like those in cosmopolitan areas and in suburban areas. So it's a very valid chat. And I do not want Sarah to think that the contributions that were um, sadly, very ableist and insensitive should uh, be perceived as the direction of what this portfolio committee primarily represents. We are here to defend the people and not necessarily a bill that does not serve the people in the way that it should. So if a person with a disability in rural areas uh, will get into a situation at nighttime when clinics are closed, when hospitals are three hours away, we cannot still in the same breath assert that it is equitable uh, access to healthcare. It cannot be universal healthcare coverage. If for some people, if for those living in rural areas and township areas, it is between business hours. And those are part and parcel of the conversations that we should be having that who is it equitable for? Who is it accessible to? And then if people or persons that are representing people with disabilities are saying it does not encompass this particular constituency, as a portfolio committee, we should be to that, especially because majority of us do not live with disabilities in the community. So we do not even have a, a, a pivotal in the discussion because healthcare should be for everybody. And that's why I primarily uh, want to appreciate the deliberations and the presentation by Sada. Um, but I also want to ask, what then is the direction? How then do you deliberate? And how then do you view the NHI bill if you are noting the inadequacies in addressing or uh, covering uh, persons with disabilities? Like, especially because we know, for example, that in this instance, for example, in children in Limpopo, when five years to be able to have access to hearing aids. How is that being addressed? How is the issue of persons with disabilities being addressed in the bill uh, in regards to referral system, in regards to infrastructure as well? Because we've raised as well in the portfolio committee that the bill does not cover the issue of infrastructure. The current uh, diagnosis or the current circumstance of infrastructure in our public health care facilities is actually one that is catering for persons without disabilities to be able to cater for the needs of persons with disabilities and is not necessarily accessible in the way that it should be for persons with disabilities. How then do you, as SADA, read the current uh, a dispensation on the current circumstance of healthcare and where the NHI is taking with the current gaps 
do you then come and say to the portfolio committee that it is equitable, that it is uh, it does prompt access to everybody else, and it does address the issues of persons with disabilities, and it will address the health concerns that you have raised in this portfolio committee in this meeting. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, I only have one question. CETA is of the view that they have been prevented from providing inputs and comments on the definitions section of the bill. My understanding is this portfolio committee engaging CETA to solicit those inputs. My question, therefore, what makes CETA believe that they were singled out and prevented from contributing to the definition areas of the bill. May I please get some clarity in this regard? Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, thank you for the presentation uh, that was made. Um, I would like to acknowledge the concern uh, on the listing of disabilities and the impact thereof uh, about its inclusion in the NHI bill. And I think uh, it stands to be considered within the further discussions by the committee itself, because it's very important. And uh, the second one, in connection with the uh, information that was said, pertaining to the funding where the presenter said funding there is no clear they are not quite clear distinct ways that are uh, reflected in the in the in the nha uh, bill but uh, my uh, aspect is that in chapter 10 section 48 and 49 uh, does it it not provide enough information pertaining to the uh, to the fund including section 35 and other referred sections thereof. And what more, according to you, is still expected to make this aspect more clearer? Thank you, Chair. Chair? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson, I will also cover the question of uh, Honorable Suela is having a connection uh, problem. Uh, it seems as if there's a connection problem across uh, the country. Uh, ma let me first welcome the presentation uh, from SADA. Um, I'm having uh, two questions that I want to ask, but I also raise questions as I indicated before. Uh, SADA has raised some uh, concerns around the referral system uh, proposed in the bill. Is the recommendation from SADA suggesting that persons living with disabilities should be excluded from the referral uh, system requirements? If that is the case, may I get some clarity how SADA see this uh, different system working? And most importantly, how can this system be uh, accommodated in the bill? Uh, the other question, uh, Chairperson, um, given that medicine uh, registrations are regulated through the medicines, and a related um, act, and that uh, SAPRA has since uh, the year 2018 put uh, measures in place to address backlogs in medicine registration. Uh, my question is, how does SADA believe that the bill could address medicine uh, registration issues when these are already addressed in the Medicine Act. Um, 
Uh, question 11, Chairperson. Uh, my last question, uh, question four. Uh, we appreciate the detail of your input and the recognition that you want to see uh, equitable, accessible access to quality healthcare. We also acknowledge your uh, reconnection of uh, the difference between the NHI as a purchaser and the uh, providers and suppliers of services. Do you accept that a system and legislation already exist? For the example, the National Health Act and uh, OHSC, the Disability Protection Act, to mention but a, a few. Uh, do you accept that the NHI Act will allow the fund to provide an uh, overreaching guide that will ensure uh, that the services it contracts with ensure that the right of all persons uh, are met in accordance with the uh, 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 constitution. Jushin, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Stengwa. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, let me welcome the presentation from SADA. And I have been covered by Dr. Tembe Wayo in some areas of concern. But I have one seeking clarity question. In the NHI bill, Sada said, the NHI bill does not list disability in the list. I am looking for clarity. What list or the are categories they must be listed in this in that bill. Lastly, the SATA talking about a very painful thing about the affordability of paying the health care in the public or in the private because they cannot afford to pay with their disability grant. Let me ask, what is your opinion as such or suggesting in regard to this, to this uh, affordability of paying health care of this disability? Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable members, for all of those questions you had raised. I'm going to raise my two questions now and then allow Mr. Plessy to answer those questions. Now, I do note your concern about the NHI protecting the rights of people with disabilities, uh, but it's also captured within section six of the bill, which is dedicated to the rights of users of NHI. And uh, we people, including people with disabilities, and specifically section 6E, which states that users are not to be unfairly discriminated against as provided in the Constitution and the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act 2000, which is Act number four of 2000. And the question is whether this section then does not address your fears. Um, uh, you also make a suggestion in your presentation that it should be mandatory for people with living with disabilities to be included in the pricing committee. Um, now, there are important criteria to use in constituting such a committee, which should mainly focus on skills. And so my question would be why you believe that people living with disabilities in general will provide additional value to the deliberations of this particular committee. And what in your experience is raising concern about price and services for people living with disability. 
Honourable members, my voice is not too good today, um, so excuse me for that. Um, Mr. Duplessis, you're very welcome to answer those questions now. And remember that your time extends to, let me just have a look for us to complete the answer session by the latest 12.45, uh, no, not 12, yeah. We are early, so uh, you're very welcome to just um, continue and, and finish this, uh, hopefully within the next 15, 20 minutes, your answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Honorable Chair. So um, if there's any if there's anything that I um, am not comfortable with, I'll need to defer to my colleagues um, and then possibly make written submissions. But I think everything that has been brought up here is, is relatively, um, I think I'm comfortable enough to answer. Um, <clears throat> so with regards to the first questions by Honorable Munyai, um, the question was with regards to the quality of healthcare systems um, and the word that quality appears 30 times suggesting it addresses the problem. I think our, the point that we are trying to make there is quality is very different. The definition of quality or the value of quality is very different when you are looking at it from a payer's perspective versus the receiver's perspective. And that ultimately what defines quality from, from your perspective is very different to what defines quality from our perspective. This is evident in terms of if you refer back to what we were saying about um, the seating requirements for a disabled person needs to be reevaluated every six months or a growing child needs to be reevaluated every six months. That is currently not accounted for in the existing system, which shows that the, the existing system has an idea that quality healthcare involves providing the child with a, um, a seating device. However, quality from the patient's perspective involves that that be reevaluated on an every six month basis. So I think that the nuance there is around what defines quality and there is always a difference in terms of the payer's perspective, as well as the receiver's perspective. With regards to the question around um, a concern around the lack of consultation, and with regards, we have, yes, absolutely, we have had the opportunity to submit comments, but I'm gonna, and it's going to be a thought provoking comment that I'm gonna bounce back at you. In the event that I was someone who was deaf um, and blind, how would I have engaged in this morning's consultative process. Um, and I think that therein lies what we are trying to say. We are not saying that the system doesn't allow for us to do it. We are saying that the, it's not necessarily expanded to allow for input from a variety of disabled individuals and therefore excludes um, certain individuals from the process to some extent. So in the event that I was a, an individual who had hearing difficulties, I would not have been able to participate in this today. Um, unless a specific recommendation or unless a specific um, uh, accommodation was made, but I would have had to ask for it. I think we'd like to see a world where it is automatically offered or that there's a comment around um, in the event that you are needing uh, definitive assistance in this regard, this is the process to follow. So I think I just want to make that, um, uh, to put it forward that we're not saying it's not inclusive, we're just saying it doesn't, it's not widely inclusive. Um, with regards to the referral systems, the question was, should they be excluded? Absolutely not. We are not saying referral systems should be excluded for people with disability. We are saying they need to be expanded and they needs to be a manner of escalation um, where necessary, which we are not, we do not see it in our existing system. And we would like to see it allowed for within the NHI framework so that we are ensured that people who are impacted by disability have the possibility to escalate and in increase the referrals time frame because at the moment, it is lengthy, particularly for those coming through from rural areas. And unfortunately, the, the compounding um, impact of those lengthy referrals have a negative impact on the patient's quality of life while they are waiting. Um, with regards to the comments that were brought forward um, by Honorable Mokilisa, um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the surname there. It, I think it was Chukajia. Um, so, with, so, Katja, so, Katja. 
So kacha, I wasn't too bad. Thank I was you. trying to spell it. I wasn't too bad. Thank I had a T in front of that. <laughs> so, thanks, baby. <laughs> no problem. Um, with regards to that, you um, specifically made reference with regards to the NHI structures and the function of the bill um, and all its constituents cons um, and all its constituents to rather consult annually. We are saying we don't wait. We don't want to wait for the problems to have accumulated for a year before we have the opportunity to address and ventilate them. And that's why we are so adamant that all elements of the NHI structures need to have patient representation. Um, I will expand further on this as there was another question with regards to the expansion of that. If we had everybody included, um, would it be problematic? But I will expand. I'm just trying to work out where that came from. Um, with regards to the quantity, the quality of services, um, the NHI, the, um, my note here says define as health services managed. It's not with regards um, to the, the quality of the services, it's with regards to the extent. We're not saying that the services aren't there. We are saying that the extent of services needs to be um, expanded. So at the moment, a, a patient who requires long-term speech therapy might only get seen by a speech therapist once a month or once every two months. We would like to see them being treated optimally so that if they had a six months, um, uh, I want to say more uh, heavier intervention, but heavy is not the right word, more contact time within a shorter time frame, they might not need extended uh, speech therapy. So those are the things that we see. We, the, the current system is very much set in stone. It's we can provide you with X, Y, and Z. We'd like to see it, the system understanding that not it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And whilst we understand that that is what the bill intends to do, we would like to see how they intend to do it. And this is why our ability to be able to provide input into the various committees is so critically important. Because if there are certain nuances that we know because we live with these conditions all the time. There are certain nuances that we understand will very often be left off the, the, um, the minds of those who are not living with it every day. And that's why we feel um, we need to be able to participate in, the, in those systems. With regards to the implications of referral systems, how do we view the existing system? The existing referral system is a long process. It's very, very long-winded. It takes a lot of time, and it very often requires a fair amount of patient energy. You can appreciate that, and that is for a generalized patient um, with a complex or, or chronic problem. You can very much appreciate that when you've got the likes of poor infrastructure, et cetera, compounding to that issue, that those referral systems are simply no longer inadequate. Um, and we would simply like to see mechanisms for escalation in that regard um, for and, and ways in which we can put forward urgency where necessary. Um, uh, Honorable Howard said uh, with regards to um, setting aside um, of, of, of disability within the NHI. And no, we are saying that that's not, and that assertion is incorrect. That's not what we are wanting to see. We are wanting to see expansion. We are wanting to see further expansion um, and further inclusion within the system. So we feel at, this, at, at the moment, it's probably rank, ranking a one or two. We'd like to see it move up to an eight or a nine in terms of inclusivity. So we are not wanting to be set aside. By setting us aside, we further marginalize ourselves. We are saying we should be included um, to the extent we shouldn't have to have discussions around disabilities being its own sector. It should be included. We should get to the point where accommodations for disability is as easily um, discussed or administrated as is any other patient sector. Um, with regards to um, Honorable uh, Tim Bacquio, um, with regards to the funding element, it is our ascertain, what is our understanding, yes, how the fund enables to be set up is, is set out. But is that practical in the existing economy is the one question. How do individuals who are ready, we see such a low tax base within the South African sector, we see such, we see, we've seen a complete drop off in terms of um, contributions to private schemes at the moment. And we understand that, that those private scheme members will, will have to move across to the NHI. And we're seeing a decrease 
at that side at the moment. Our, our question or our comment isn't around how, it's around the practicality and whether it will actually address and serve um, and be able to bring in the amount of funding that is required to be able to fulfill all the services that are necessary. Um, Honorable Geller asked with regards, is the system as it stands currently working? Do we need a different system? The system is working. Is it working efficiently? Our, our assertion would be probably not. And that's what we wanna see change. We, like I said, we wanna see inclusivity to the point that we forget that we were ever a separated sector. With regards to um, the SAPRA, we would like to see an escalation process. I think understanding that, that there is certain times where urgency needs to be, and we saw it within the COVID space. We saw it within vaccines. There was, a, there was an urgency to bring vaccines to book quicker if they had slotted into the general registration process, well, I mean, we'd probably still be waiting for any of us to be vaccinated. So we have seen, and I think COVID has actually been, you know, they say never let a good crisis go to waste. I think COVID's actually brought about um, a lot of understanding with regards to um, stigmatization, isolation, separation, um, the need to think out the box, the need to understand that some patients require more than others, so I think it's actually been a very, very beneficial understanding and learning curve for us as a healthcare sector. But we have seen how when there's a will, there is actually a way to escalate certain things. And we would like to see those escalation processes remain going forward so that there are the options where necessary to, to get some speed um, and impetus if it's needed. With regards to um, the NHI Act providing an overreaching guide, um, is that considered, you know, would we consider that that would be um, reasonable? Yes, on the premise that the overreaching guide is, is driven by the patient needs. It cannot be driven, and that's why patient input into the systems are so critically important. It is impossible to, to develop any sort of guideline around a complicated health issue without understanding the needs of the patient on a daily basis. And if we're not including patients in those processes, we're simply not going to have the knowledge and the insight that is required to develop those guidelines that will essentially be um, inclusive and provide the necessary framework that is necessary. Um, with regards to um, Honorable Hlengwa, um, DHI disability is not um, it was with regards to disability being mentioned and our comments around the fact that we're saying disability. Our issue re remains on the fact that disability has not been defined. So when you are referencing something, um, not excluding someone based on the basis of disability, what does that look like? That's what we'd like to see. We'd like to see disability as a definition included in that framework so that it is very clear what is included and excluded from that box per se. With regards to affordability, um, uh, firstly, I think at the moment, we understand that any further burden on um, disabled patients is simply not an option. They are burdened enough. In a world where education, equality and equity exists, as well as equity in the workplace, when that is and we are seeing, I know that um, Honorable Munyai said, we're seeing two to 3%. We are sitting with an with a average of 8% disability in South Africa. So when we've got 8%, um, when we've got the numbers up from an employment perspective, up to 8%, I think then we could probably reevaluate. And when we've got education to a point that all individuals with, an, with a disability have been equally educated and have had accessibility to, um, to education, then we could probably re-ascertain whether or not they'd be able to contribute. But at the moment, with the education statistics being as low as they are, as well as the employment uh, being as low and as, as difficult as it is for those impacted by disability, affordability currently as a stand is simply not possible. And we as an organization would obviously like to see some form of con uh, um, concessions made with regards to how people who are impacted by disability would be expected to contribute towards this fund. And then lastly, with regards um, to uh, Honorable the Chair Jacobs, um, with regards, again, back to the definition, uh, and I think I have explained we'd like to see 
the expansion of what the dis what disability looks like from a definitions perspective with regards to the NHI. Um, and the mandatory inclusion in committees is based on skills. As I've, I think I've highlighted, and you know, where could we add value? We add value by ensuring that those who are looking for solutions have an in-depth, intimate understanding of the problem. You cannot understand a healthcare issue unless you have lived with it. You will not consider all the things that need to be considered unless you have a personal, intimate understanding of the day-to-day -day lives of those patients. And that is where we add value. Yes, we might not have the necessary skills and expertise with regards to healthcare systems and formulations and health economics, et cetera, but we are without a doubt lay experts with regards to our conditions and the impact that living with these conditions presents on a day-to-day -day basis. And that should be the most valuable input and skill that is required in these committees if we are ever going to see an NHI that is truly inclusive and equitable for all. So with that said, I think I've answered um, any questions. If there's anything that I haven't that requires further clarity, if you could possibly raise it, I think we might still have uh, one or two minutes. Um, alternatively, we'd be happy to engage in writing if necessary. Thank you very much, Mr. Blessing. If you feel there is anything that you have left out, you're very welcome to send that writing to us by the Deputy Secretary. We appreciate you coming today and to during these presentations. Um, and also for the uh, fair and open answers to those questions raised. Thank you very much again. Um, we will move on to the next group. You're very welcome to maybe give a last remark. Yes, just to say thank you very, very much for the committee's time this morning and for the opportunity for us to engage. And, and we would really like to see this sort of engagement carry on. And our hands are always up um, in terms of providing the necessary insight that might be needed. So if, if ever there's a time that anybody feels that they need further understanding, um, our hands are always up to assist in that regard. Most certainly, it's a group of people we should not forget about. They are as, as important as any other person. Uh, so, yes, you're very welcome at any time. And then with that said, you're very welcome to stay on for the next presentation, should you so wish, or you may leave. But thank you very much for that. Our next group, honorable members, would be the South African Federation for Mental Health. And... Um, I'm hoping that they are on the platform, which I'm sure they would be, if we can have the leader of that group just introducing him or herself, and then also introducing the rest of their members, and then we will continue from there. Thank you. Uh, very good morning. Oh, is it? Yes, still morning. Uh, to the committee and to the chair. Uh, I am Bharti Patel. I am the director of the South African Federation for Mental Health. Um, I want to be able to share my screen. I'm just checking if I do have sharing. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, yes, Bharti, you can see it. Thank you. So good morning and thank you again for inviting us today. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to present on our 2019 submission. And we also take this opportunity to highlight additional work that has taken place since our submission to the Portfolio Committee in 2019. Just a bit about who um, the SA Federation is. I just want to clear my screen. Okay. So we are a national non-governmental organization situated in Johannesburg. We have 17 member organizations who are community-based mental health organizations who provide direct community services around mental health. Um, and then we also have member organizations who are associate members who operate in the field of mental health. We are in existence for over 100 years, 
and one of the largest mental health federations in South Africa. We work closely with government um, to uh, provide uh, programs around mental health. We work with other NGOs um, and national and international partners. Our main focus really is around mental health awareness, advocacy, human rights, and capacity building. I do want to just mention uh, and introduce you to Shani Geffen. I'm not sure if she's already uh, joined the meeting. Uh, who is the project leader for advocacy and awareness at the Federation uh, and who has assisted me in putting this presentation together. We are also grateful to be joined um, this morning by um, authors of the mental health investment case in South Africa. That is Donella Besada, uh, Dr. Sumeya Dokrat and Professor Crick Blunt from the University of Cape Town. The mental health investment case for South Africa was commissioned by the National Department of Health in 2018 and introduced during the virtual national dialogue um, on mental health, which was led by our current Honorable Minister of Health as part of the country's 2021 World Mental Health Day commemorative event. The South African Federation for Mental Health um, just excuse me, I'm admitting, okay. Participated in this research study together with uh, other leaders uh, and representatives from numerous sectors working towards making mental health a reality for all. So aspect of the information shared today is based on the mental health information case report, which has undergone numerous reviews with the Department of Health and my understanding is that it is awaiting final approval for inclusion in the upcoming NHC tech meeting. The foundation study, a foundational study began in 2017 to quantify the costs of mental health services and programs in South Africa in collaboration with the National Department of Health. So we look forward to the official launch of this report as it will inform the decisions for updating our mental health policy review uh, policy and strategic action plan. It will also add benefits to the uh, service benefits framework for the NHI and updates to the non-communicable disease strategic plan. Um, so I think, you know, today I have these colleagues here who will help me answer any questions uh, that I have been witnessing coming through from the portfolio committee. So the presentation today will outline a background on mental health services in South Africa, our request for the NHI, our request more in detail so you have an understanding of why we are asking for specific issues to be addressed and then also expected outcomes in terms of the requests. And then hopefully we can answer your questions at the end. So in terms of a background on mental health, universal health coverage strives for accessible, timely quality healthcare for all without anyone suffering undue financial repercussions. So it is vital for us to continue to uphold these values of human rights, equity, and evidence-informed practice in our decision-making around the NHI benefit packages. In the bill's preamble, we welcomed the reference made to mental health within Article 12 of the UN Covenant of, on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, as well as Article 16 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. This roots the bill in a human rights-based approach to mental health. We know mental health is health, and there is no health without mental health. Yet mental health care and related services have never enjoyed the same resourcing as other types of health services in our country. This is all the more concerning given mental health and substance use disorders are the leading cause 
of years lost to disability in South Africa. Statistics have shown that 9.5 million people are living with mental, neurological or substance use disorder in South Africa. 27% of the population are estimated to be risky alcohol and substance users. And less than one in 10 people are living with a mental health condition in South Africa, and they don't receive the care they need. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted a greater need for mental health services for the general population, which is a group of people who have never had a mental health condition before. And this is owing to the growing economic recession, massive unemployment, food insecurity, and domestic violence. In addition, we have seen a decline in mental health visits and reported increases and patients defaulting their treatment appointments. In 2020, the United Nations Secretary General called on all countries to pay greater attention to mental health in response to COVID-19. The United for Global Mental Health, a strong global advocacy movement who we have partnered with has issued calls to place mental health at the core of the post-pandemic economic recovery efforts and has supported the development of national mental health investment cases, while the World Health Organization, which is providing technical assistance to countries to strengthen their mental health response to the pandemic. On a regional level, we find the African Union Center for Disease Control and Prevention recently commissioned a call to develop a standalone strategic plan for mental health. And this will form part of the overall Africa CDC NCD five-year strategy to enable core funds to be allocated for mental health at a continental level for the first time ever. So with this information at hand, and this reality, we ask that this NHI bill must make provision for, a, for the mental health to be elevated within our health system, given one, the historic inequalities and inefficiencies in human and financial resourcing, and two, there is a bi-directional relationship in which poverty leads to greater rates of mental illness, with mental in illnesses increasing the likelihood of people living in poverty. So today we plead with the portfolio committee for three main actions. We want to see or ensure there is a medium term conditional grant earmarked investments in the mental health system in advance of a fully implemented NHI. We encourage investment and monitoring of this grant wisely into, in, into contextually relevant evidence-based mental health services for population mental health. This includes specifically intersectoral community-based mental health services, expanded primary health care mental health services, prevention and promotion interventions. We will talk to this a bit later on. And then thirdly, we ask that we work to, we want to ensure that other government departments ensure that their policies and budgets augment the NHI mental health benefit packages for successful implementation. So in terms of this medium term conditional grant for mental health care and services, we believe the conditional grant for mental health is necessary to correct injustices of the past regarding mental health allocation, as well as invest in scaling up mental health care in the country. It is important to note here that while we call for an immediate earmarked investment in mental health as an absolute necessity in the medium term, our economists advise that about, after about 15 years, we eventually see this allocation to be absorbed in the general NHI budget. 
It is estimated it will take about 15 years to ensure full integration of mental health care services into our existing health system. For there to be improvements in the efficiency of spending of scarce resources, to sensitize and build capacity within provinces on how to implement mental health care and to involve the NGO sector within collaborative models of care. This time allows for the returns of investment modeled within the investment case to be achieved. After this time, a specific earmarked budget may no longer be required. In terms of costs, we advocate that the recommendations made in the investment case report be considered and our colleagues from University of Cape Town can advise further. We also want to note that we recognize the difficult choices this portfolio committee needs to make in terms of spending and at what cost. We do not want the NHI to be a catch-all for all societal issues. However, establishing what is a priority for the NHI is quite imperative. We therefore ask for the Department of Health to undertake an explicit priority setting exercise for the NHI packages of care already drafted within the mental health investment case, so as to get specialist clinical input. We also recommend that the Department of Health and the committee establishes a process with key stakeholders, which includes mental health care users, to review and interrogate what these packages and the potential benefits could be, taking our human rights obligations into consideration. We ask also that this explicit priority setting exercise is informed by a needs-based approach rather than the current service use approach. And there must be considerations around burden of disease, treatment gaps, inclusivity, accessibility, and availability of cost-effective interventions. These should be driving the prioritization of health services and the associated budget. When it comes to investment in the mental health services for max maximum population mental health, we want to see appropriate sp spending of this mental health care grant, namely increased investment in terms of the intersectoral community-based mental health services, where more people can access mental health services and support at community level. We want to see expanded primary health care mental health services, where people can access mental health care at primary health level through the strengthened training of generalist workers and strong mentorship and supervision structures. The prevention and promotion interventions for improving and managing mental wellness, including in early investments in child and adolescent mental health services. So we generally support the World Health Organization proposed mental health system, which you see here on the screen, the majority of the services and prevention programs are provided in community settings, ensuring greater reach and access of services. In terms of investment in mental health services for maximum population mental health, we did in our submission caution that it is critical to ensure that these complementary services do not encompass essential population health needs that would limit the fund's capacity to achieve equity in access, the financial and financial protection, ultimately towards achieving universal health coverage. Given this, we recommend for the NHI to recognize community mental health services, primary health care, and mental health promotion and prevention services as essential population mental health needs, integrated into broader health sector and program performance evaluations conducted during the phased NHI implementation period. Accordingly, we also recommend that the role of mental health NGO personnel 
And here we talk about social workers, auxiliary social workers, occupational therapists, and carers. Through their emphasis on rehabilitation, be regarded as critical personnel to achieve the universal health coverage goals. It is also recommended that the NGO personnel and traditional healers be included in the definition of healthcare service providers, accompanied by explicit efforts to measure and coordinate the extent and scope of their involvement in improving the lives of those living with mental illness in South Africa. People in provincial and national government, civil society and at district level must be held accountable for how this budget is spent via very clear reporting mechanisms. But before we can take, before this can take place, we need to prioritize investment in governance structures at these levels, as well as capacity building efforts to translate national guidance and policies, including this investment case into provincial implementation plans. We are indeed pleased to see chapter eight of the bill makes provision for investment in information systems. Indeed, not only do we need to spend on our mental health, our, not only do we need to spend our mental health budget more wisely, we also need the implementation of monitoring and reporting systems, ensuring this budget will be spent as intended, accompanied by realistic targets and measurable indicators. On the topic of information systems and data collection, routine information systems need to be strengthened in order for healthcare establishments and the department to monitor the quality of care and service provision to identify sources of inefficiency. Only two indicators for mental health are included in the district health information system. And this is for mental health clients who are over and under 18 and mental health admissions. This we believe is insufficient to assess the full extent of the burden of disease and the nature of service delivery for mental health. So our recommendation in, with regard to this is that we need increased capturing of mental health data which should be integrated into the general mental health, general health management information system. We appreciate that some of these services may technically fall under the Department of Social Development, the Department of Labor, and even the Department of Education. And we recommend that these departments also improve their data systems for capturing mental health information and ensure a system of data sharing. So when it comes to intersectoral community mental health services, the role of licensed community-based mental health organizations, and here we talk about community-based organizations, NPOs, and non-governmental organizations, that provide essential community-based day and residential mental health services has been well-documented. Examples of such services include residential and daycare services, psychosocial and rehabilitation services, mental health literacy and awareness services, and medication adherence support services. And past research has already established that these community mental health services remain underdeveloped and they require substantial investment to build up this platform. Our recommendation here is that these services must be acknowledged in the NHI bill to ensure funds are directed towards the progressive development of community-based mental health services. Unfortunately, the operation of unlicensed and unregulated non-governmental organizations working in this field persists, largely because the licensing process mandated by the Department of Health is too cumbersome and expensive, and it requires that these NGOs to function to a large extent as if they are tertiary facilities. As a result, 
all too often we hear about how the human rights of people living with mental illness have been undermined and disregarded as there is a lack of accountability and human rights protection. And this has to stop. Our recommendation here is that we need to revise the current licensing regulations of mental health, NGOs, NPOs, and CBOs to enable a formal network of care. This process must be user-friendly and financially viable with the organizations incurring minimal costs in staff time and finances to comply. The current requirements are too convoluted and this disincentivizes organizations from being licensed. There exists a promising opportunity to draw on the support and the experience of numerous nonprofit organizations already within the SA Federation for Mental Health to develop, implement, and upscale a standardized package of person-centered care that provides a spectrum of appropriate and comprehensive services according to population need. I want to share with you an example of you know, practice that is available in the community. We have Cape Mental Health, um, which is a member of the South African Federation for Mental Health. They provide psychosocial rehabilitation services and adopt a biopsychosocial approach providing a continuum of care from hospital to community that offers better prognosis for recovery and well-being. It provides cognitive and functional gains as well as the development of social and work skills. This organization alone has 26 psychosocial support, rehabilitation support groups, which remained fully active during this pandemic. We also saw that there was a decrease in the rate of relapses for those attending these support groups. The work being done by Cape Mental Health has been fully funded by the Western Cape Department of Health, and it shows that willing provincial government departments can work together with NGOs. I invite the committee to you know, visit these programs and see the value that they've added to the communities in which they serve. So we want to see these psychosocial rehabilitation models being incorporated into the NHI. In terms of primary health care, we need more investment in primary health care services. Mental health service delivery is still absolutely hospice-centric. And that is within tertiary specialized care, ultimately translating in limited access to services for the majority of the population and considerable inefficiencies in resource use. Currently, only approximately 8% of spending is estimated to go to primary health care level, and we need it to be more. So our recommendation here is that provisions should be made to ensure that primary health care is recognized as the key level of service provision in which mental health is fully integrated. Previously evaluated models of integrating mental health into primary health care systems in South Africa should be used to inform primary health care, primary care mental health functions at district and sub-district level. In particular, we mentioned the work of PRIME, the PRIME study which piloted and evaluated the integration of mental health into primary health care. This is of particular relevance here. We know mental health care can be successfully integrated within primary health care clinics through the provision of interventions that promote task sharing of basic counseling and referral. By strengthening our primary health care level clinics, the clinics itself will increasingly play a role of patient referrals, including upward referrals for uh, increasingly complex cases, as well as for cases stepped down from hospital settings. 
So decentralization of mental health services towards increased primary health care provision must be accompanied by um, significant scale up in training capacity whilst ensuring that adequate supervision is pro provided. We note that provinces have already noted that with sufficient training and support, generalist health workers be able to provide mental health services. So our recommendation is we want to see clarity about the reimbursement mechanisms that will adopt what well, will be adopted for primary health care services towards ensuring quality of mental health service delivery is incentivized and as and an accreditation process that is aligned with targeted investments to improve mental health infrastructure and re human resource development. In terms of the prevention and promotion interventions, when we commit to investing in promotion and preventative care for, within the general population, we see socioeconomic returns and less of a burden on our health sector. There is global consensus that childhood and adolescence offer a key window of opportunity to promote positive mental health with demonstrated benefits across the life course. We recommend and we advocate that a conditional grant must be included, must include promotional and preventative activities, including those aimed at children and adolescents, specifically the inclusion of the universal school, social and emotional learning program for all school-going children aged 12 to 17 years in the conditional mental health grant. This should be co-financed with other government departments. These programs have demonstrated long-term benefits, including improved emotional and social functioning, positive health behaviors like health seeking, prevention of lifelong mental health consequences of the experience of living in poverty and improved academic performance. While services in schools fall short under the mandate of the Department of Basic Education, as part of the primary health care re-engineering policy, the Department of Health and Social Development have a key role to play in school-based health services, including support with school-based nurses who are well placed to identify children and adolescents with mental health needs. Schools remain a key space for the identification of these key population groups who often do not attend facilities, particularly due to the relative absence of adolescent friendly services. We are also concerned about the lack of mention of health promotion services to be offered within the NHI. The capacitation approach as a payment mechanism carries the risk of underservicing vulnerable groups with a focus on curative services at the expense of preventative services. And therefore, mixed payment provider mechanisms should be considered. Our recommendation here is that performance-based financing, such as targets for personal preventative services, meaning screenings and health talks, must be included. To recap here, by improving mental health services in the community and primary health care level, we can increase access and save costs to the health sector. In terms of access, this has hopefully been well explained that integrating services at this level increases accessibility. In terms of cost, we are reducing the need for expensive inpatient services and addressing the currently very high rate of readmission. This is especially important in South Africa, as most hospitals report extremely long length of stays for patients. To work with other governments, we want to see collaboration um, 
government departments, both nationally and provincially, continue to operate in silos, which inevitably create gaps in mental health services to the communities. In order to address this gap, we would like to see increased collaboration with the Department of Health and other government departments. And this is essential to provide efficient community-based and primary health care mental health service offerings. For example, the Department of Education would be expended, expected to fund and monitor the social and, and, and emotional learning program that has already been mentioned. The Department of Social Development will continue to cover subsidies um, paid to people with mild intellectual disability who are living in community-based facilities, many of which are used to fund the programs of the organizations. They, are also, they will also have to expand their mandate in terms of the establishment and management of substance use rehabilitation centers. These grants are not only essential in the operation of community-based organizations, but it also mean, it's also a means to prevent and address the vicious cycle of poverty and mental illness. The Department of Human Settlements, as mandated, will provide housing needs for mental health care users who are able to live independently in the community in residential care. We know calling for de-siloing can be very complicated and often quite idealistic and theoretical. However, in the investment case report, there are clear recommendations about how this collaboration should occur and who would be responsible for what costs over the 15 year scale up. To recap, we present before you today the following request for mental health to be a priority package within NHI and to receive a conditional grant to earmark capital bridge funding for over a 15 year period scaled up sufficiently. We need to see funding and investment go towards key strategies which place our country on a firm trajectory towards community-based mental health services, integrated primary health care mental health services, and promotion and prevention services. That these efforts must be supplemented by other national and provincial government departments. So what would be the expected outcomes should our requests be entertained? From a health gains perspective, we see that 2.2 million years of healthy life will be restored through the provision and scale up of treatment and rehabilitative services, with close to 2.5 million prevalent cases averted and over 44,000 deaths avoided. The Universal School Social and Emotional Program is estimated to contribute significantly to averting prevalent cases of depression and anxiety, resulting in over 415,000 cases averted, in addition to achieving over 89,000 healthy life years gained. And from an econ economic perspective, the potential economic returns due to restored productivity and health over the scaled up period amounts to 124.5 billion rands. Lastly, but arguably, and most importantly, from a human rights perspective, we can expect a 5.3 fold increase in the number of persons in need of in need who will receive care. This means more than five times more people would be able to access quality care that they do deserve. Every recommendation, intervention and service we present here today is based on a human rights based approach. We could not stand here before you today without referring to life as a domain and the tragic consequences, during which the Gauteng Health Department's actions 
through an ill-fated attempt at deinstitutionalization, resulted in the deaths of more than 144 mental health care users, with many left unaccounted for. Currently, nearly five years after this event took place, a national inquiry is underway. Despite this severe time lapse, it is encouraging to see that we as a country will never forget those lives lost. We have faith in our courts and our constitution for justice to be served and human rights for all to be observed. The government needs to work extensively to address the wrongs of the past, regain public's trust in future deinstitutionalization efforts, and invest in a human rights-based sustained commitment to mental health system reforms. Human rights relating to mental health within universal health coverage systems must be monitored and departments held accountable for their commitment. At this pivotal moment in history, this moment that will surely be remembered for decades to come with regard to how leadership and governments led the way in recovery from the pandemic and in lifting nations from the health and economic crisis felt worldwide, it is critical that finance ministries take the lead in providing transformative investment in mental health in order to ensure sustained well-being, productivity, and prosperity for their nations for many more years to come. I thank you, Chair, and the Portfolio Committee for this opportunity to present regarding mental health in the National Health Insurance Bill. And as a member of the South African uh, Alliance Partnership, we also endorse all other submissions that were made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Patel, for this wonderful presentation. Of course, mental health affects uh, daily living, uh, relationships, uh, physical health, and so it is, it is very important that people like yourself do go on advocating for the mental health, the good mental health of all people. And uh, looking after mental health can preserve the person's ability to enjoy life. So yes, uh, we appreciate this presentation from yourself. There are a number of members who want to raise some questions with you. I just need to go and have a look at my system. Uh, the first member is Honorable Mundiai, followed by Honorable Sukacha and Honorable, Honorable Harvard. Any other members who want to raise any questions, you can shout your name on this platform. Robert, thank you, Chairperson. Did you say you will, Honorable Fasade? No, I'm saying I'm covered. Thank you, Chair. Covered. Thank you very much. Any other members so far? We have only four, three members, and uh, Honorable Slengwa indicated that she's having a network challenge. And Honorable Wilson was having a network challenge earlier, as well as Honorable Ismail. So there does seem to be some network challenges uh, nationally. Um, I think for now, we will take those members in that order. Monia is to catch up. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for preparing an investment case for mental health, which outline clearly the size of the problem, the nature of the problem, the approach to service improvement, and the benefits to be gained thereof. You suggest that before NHI can be implemented, the country must establish a conditional grant for 15 years. Are you aware that the financial implication of the NHI bill include conditional grants for mental health between 2019 to 2021? Let me repeat. 
Are you aware that the financial implication of the National Health Insurance Bill includes conditional grant for mental health between the year 2019 2019 to 2021? Uh, should your concern be uh, be the size of the budget rather than establishing conditional a conditional grant? But I must also say that uh, issues of the mental health occupies the center stage in the national, in the current ANC-led government. And the issues of the, of the human rights that you talk about, you know that it's as a consequence of the 1994 breakthrough, which indeed gave you an opportunity to speak about human rights in the context of the, of the mental health. Before 1994, you will know that a special care for mental health will be a case geared to protect a minority few. And as you know, going forward, national health insurance is geared to make access to health care for all our people, regardless of your mental status, uh, regardless of your social economic condition. I want to ask the question, are you comfortable with the current uh, status quo of two tier systems, which really does not address uh, uh, the healthcare for all our people? Because it, it must be for you to be able to access in the current uh, two tier system, you need to have a powerful pocket. And those that don't have access to money, they don't have to access the, the healthcare quality of healthcare. That is the basis. Some of the challenges that you have raised, that you have raised, it's precisely why we need NHI to resolve those challenges. Lastly, I must say that the, the view that seeks to suggest that uh, we need a 15 year grant as a precondition to do NHI health reform and to implement NHI, I think is subjective because some people, to some quarters want also be a basic income grant for all. So, but we can't therefore say that basic income grant should be the precondition for us to implement NHI. A 15 year grant to be precondition and I'm sure uh, debt to GDP, it's almost 80, 90% now. By no time, it will be 100%. You know the fiscal conditions of our country. I'm sure uh, uh, Patel, you are aware of the financial you know, condition of our country. But besides that, we believe the national health uh, insurance will help all of us including that budget, the grant, as I said earlier, will cover the people that have uh, mental health care. The past, is, it does not uh, limit to life estimation alone. The past, the, goal, the past goes beyond uh, 1984, 1994. So therefore, we don't want, of course, we agree with you on the case of life estimation, the life is demanding also justify, if you look at the recommendation of the commissioner, uh, you know, would have given you the, uh, the clarity that uh, those issues justify for NHI to resolve them. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm sure you'll answer my question, but I said, all in all, what you have raised is just an investment case. And we need to have a balance with financial situation. And any grant, whether it's social grant, basic income grant, uh, and and fifteen year grant, should not be preconditioned uh, for health reform. That's my view. So I'll, I'm, <clears throat> I'll like to get your comment in this regard. Thank. You. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, uh, Honorable Jacobs, thank you very much. 
for the opportunity. Let me welcome the presentation from the South African Federation of Mental Health. Just two questions from my side. The first one, um, thank you for preparing an investment case. As Comrade Nanyai have said, it's really an investment case. You asked to support the Department of Health, whether you can help them to ensure that their mental policies and budgets are appropriate for the results and for, for the um, needs of, uh, of, 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 of your people that you're presenting. The department is uh, here. They're listening at you. They have listened at you. I encourage you to work with them to address the needs of persons with mental health challenges. That is my first comment. My second one is a question. Your request for the uh, including NGOs and traditional healers as service providers is noted. Section 39 of the uh, NHI bill sets criteria for the accreditation of service providers. These include producing proof for certification by the Office of the Health Standards Compliance, being registered with the a council as a profes professional, uh, meeting the care provision standards, adherence to treatment protocols, etc. All of these are done to ensure the quality of health services. Will they meet uh, uh, these criteria? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chair and the presenter. I have two questions. One question, NHI is aimed at funding integrated and comprehensive services. Is SAFMH not concerned with the proposal for a 15-year conditional grant? They will be perpetuating verticalization of a program. Second question, my observation is there is a challenge in having too many indicators at a high level. All programs have detailed indicators that are not in overall national data set. Is that not a better way to monitor mental health services and outcomes? Thank you. Members, anyone else who wants to raise any questions? I have yes, so far only three names. Up. Honorable Gela, please continue. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Let me also welcome the presentation. Uh, my first question, Chairperson, if you allow me to ask. Um, have you engaged the Department of Health on the proposal for a 15-year conditional grant and your investment case? What has the response from the department been? Uh, my other question, does your organization support the NHI bill and its objects? Uh, lastly, Chairperson, uh, may I inquire as to what uh, intervention is um, SAFMA involved as part of promotion and prevent mental health problems rather than the uh, curative uh, approach uh, I would have noted that uh, present, uh, prevention is actually not an integral part of a, a SAFMA's uh, presentation. Why is it so? Uh, if I can get any comments in this regard, 
Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, honorable members. Any other members who want to ask any questions? If not, I will just ask uh, two questions to you, uh, Ms. Patel. Now, you, you're critiquing the licensing uh, system across the board. The question is whether you have, uh, whether you are in agreement that the National Department of Health, the Office of Health Standards Compliance and the NHI accreditation process must be aligned, continuous and integrated, taking into account the need on the ground. And then my following question to you is on section 15, uh, subsection 3, a of the bill which makes provision for the development and funding of comprehensive health care services. My emphasis is on the word comprehensive and my question is whether uh, or, or, or what, is what makes yourself and SAFMA believe that mental health is not covered in this description and if any amendments were to be made in the bill in relation to the above what would the presenter propose be included to cover mental health over and above what is already reflected in the bill? So you've had a lot of questions being raised, anything between 10 and 12 questions, I think, being raised to you, uh, Ms. Patel. You're very welcome to answer those. Just be mindful uh, of your allocation of time. Yes, we have more than enough time, so you're very welcome to answer them as fully as you would wish to. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chair, and for the committee. I hope I have captured all the questions. Um, and I, if I haven't, you can raise them again. Um, I just want to mention that, um, yes, we are aware, you know, in terms of Honorable Munya's question, we are aware of the conditional grant. However, the size of the budget is extremely small. And therefore, you know, we are really fortunate that the Department of Health has already been proactive and has commissioned the investment case for mental health. And I think that is quite, you know, we, we want to acknowledge that because it is forward thinking to say, how realistic is this budget that we have in the NHI bill? And let science dictate and let science guide us in terms of what we would need. And I think, you know, the question of affordability is a relative question. When you look at the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, when we look at the Covenant on Social, Economic uh, uh, and Cultural and Political Rights, we know that you cannot, you know, the, you, you can't go to progressive realization of those rights. You need to, you need to have plans that address those rights today. So in view of those, um, you know, our, our parties and our agreements to uh, human rights treaties, I think we need to be realistic. We need to be able to say what has not been done in the past. Mental health has always been neglected. And we historically, we acknowledge that. The NHI bill, we are very much in favor of. But we want to enter this bill, we want to enter this piece of legislation proactively, making sure mental health is covered. We have a wonderful mental health care act. The critique around it is that it was never, there was never a budget allocated for it. So the rights around people with mental illness was never realized. We recently, in 2013, adopted the mental health policy. That policy was also critiqued because our provinces could not implement anything in those policies because there was never funding allocated to those pieces of legislation. And I think that is what we're trying to guard against. We want to be proactive. I do want um, to hand over to Donella Basada, who was involved in the investment case. And we work closely with the Department of Health. So, Donella, if you could help in terms of answering some of the questions as well. 
Hello, colleagues. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I also hopefully will try to have address all your questions. And if I've missed something, kindly just let me know. Um, as Barty mentioned, we are aware that there is a, a grant allocation within the NHI for mental health. But as she mentioned, it is a very small amount at the moment and initially was put in place to try to decrease the backlog of forensic assessments um, within our hospital systems. Um, and engagements with the provinces have indicated that there is some limitations in absorptive capacity where the provinces are actually struggling to access that grant, um, as it also requires quite a lot of sign off from provincial heads of health as well as the MECs um, and so there has to be engagement um, and capacity building across the provinces as well as as leadership in order to facilitate timely um, access to those grants um, and facilitation and just to mention in terms of the investment case itself um, what we've estimated for the initial MTAF period the so what we did is break up the allocations by different MTAF periods and the first MTAF period is actually not asking for a lot more money than what is currently being spent for mental health services at the moment. So what preceded the development of the investment case was a national costing exercise in order to understand what are we currently spending for mental health services in recognition that outside of the specialist psychiatric hospital levels who are cost centers, we have no real way of knowing what's being spent. And we also wanted to determine how that money is being spent. And so the findings from that invest from that costing exercise first revealed um, severe inefficiencies in how that money is being spent with a heavy focus on the hospital levels. As Barty mentioned, only 8% of expenditure is going towards the primary healthcare level, with 45% of expenses going towards the specialized psychiatric psychiatric hospital level and as we can see given the 90 percent treatment gap that money is not being efficiently spent and so in terms of absolute amounts we are spending approximately five percent of our health budget for mental health services but we still have a considerable treatment gap um, and so what we call for is especially in the short term not actually a lot more money but ensuring that the money is being spent more efficiently and so this is why the justification for the condition grant so that we can monitor how money is being spent and ensure it's redirected towards the primary health care level. Um, in terms of the long term, we absolutely would like to see the integration of mental health within broader health service, health service delivery and certainly do not want a verticalized system of, of service delivery, particularly in recognizing the severe comorbidities that exist between mental health and other kind of priority conditions existing in our country, namely HIV, TB, as as well as our chronic conditions, uh, including hypertension and diabetes. So we certainly would like to see an integrated service delivery model, um, but the risk is unless there is some dedicated funding in the short to medium term to scale up mental health services, de facto they will be neglected within a broader service delivery model looking for integrated services. We need our generalist workers to be trained, and so we need dedicated funding to go towards that. Um, at the moment, we haven't had comprehensive of development of our district mental health specialist teams, which will be key to ensure supervision and support to our primary health care level as well. Um, so as mentioned, yeah, what we're asking for is just ensuring that that money is reprioritized effectively, but um, the money that's currently in the in being spent is, is is an appropriate amount. Obviously, over time, as we scale up services, more money will need to be dedicated towards mental health. But hopefully, with, with the NHI contributions, we'll have a growing budget. But we absolutely recognize the budgetary constraints at the moment in South Africa, which is why we call for the efficiency in spending. I mean, what the costing sir, um, costing study also revealed is not only are we inefficiently spending our money towards hospice-centric services, but we have a significantly high level of readmission rates. And that's largely on account of, of a lack of primary and community-based services. And so 18% of, of current expenditure is actually going towards readmission rates, which are as high as 25% across all the hospital levels. And so the idea is if we develop our primary and community-based services, we can also so um, work on, on using that, that, that lost expenditure on readmission towards service delivery itself. Um, 
And then in terms of information systems, we absolutely agree. Our healthcare workers are certainly inundated with a lot of uh, information system monitoring. However, uh, and what we're not calling for is, is a huge list of indicators, but at the moment, the indicators that we have simply do not allow for monitoring at all of service delivery, of coverage, um, and of, of the quality of service delivery. And this was revealed when we even tried to undertake the costing study, where a lot of facilities couldn't report on basic indicators around um, who's getting what kind of services, what the readmission rates are, particularly around different disease areas. Um, and so these are necessary prerequisites to be able to monitor service delivery. Um, and, and, you know, the idea is, is that we strike a balance, obviously, between the other conditions. But when comparing, it's, it's difficult not to see the comparison, for instance, for HIV, where we have a considerable number of indicators, and we're really able to monitor the cascade of care. Um, and we just don't have that opportunity with regards to mental health services. And as Barty mentioned, one of the issues with the previous mental health plan is there were no indicators um, linked to the plan in order to monitor service delivery. And so really the plan stayed as an ambitious framework for service delivery without real implementation or monitoring of, of services at all. Um, and then in terms of the two-tiered system, we absolutely recognize, and that's why we support movement towards the NHI and the NHI bill is to try to um, reduce the kind of the inequality across the private and public sectors in recognizing that there's a lot of resources that lie within the private sector, particularly human resources for health, and movement towards an NHI where we would be contracting uh, from the private sector really is uh, a supported move in order to be able to draw on the resources that exist within the private sector at the moment. And we are seeing some initiatives, early initiatives of private public partnerships that need to be developed further as we move towards an NHI model. Um, and what we actually realized when through this process where we also kind of evaluated data from the private sector from discovery is that there is still, even within the private sector, considerable out-of-pocket expenditure for mental health services. So there is a lack of financial protection for mental health, even in the private sector. And so there really is um, interest within private sector providers to start piloting private public partnerships and seeing um, how that translates into improved access and and reduction in vulnerability to access those services itself. Um, and then in terms of the engagement with government, we have engaged quite a lot with government where this investment case had been presented both to the mental health directorate um, and then we presented as well to uh, the acting DG at the time as well as the DDG for primary health care services, um, as well as to Treasury. Um, and, and now it's awaiting review uh, for the upcoming NHC tech meeting next year, where hopefully it will get approval. Um, the, the period for which we, you know, we, we picked a 15 year period for modeling the investment case to allow for an incremental approach to scaling up mental health services in recognition of budgetary constraints. And we really use very modest scale up kind of targets where we scaled up coverage to approximately 30 to 35% of our population. So really not being too ambitious in recognizing at the moment, we have a virtual absence of, of coverage. And so we're not calling for something too ambitious, but it will require um, investments, of course, and we recognize that there will always be opportunity costs, which is why we ask that, you know, the, the kind of treatment package that is recommended within the investment case be analyzed within the broader requirements of a basket of care for the NHI and, and look at the budgetary implications of that um, and, and see what, what, what can be included and what we have to plan for in the longer term. Um, and so 15 years just is allowing a, a modest kind of scale up period for those services itself. Um, and yeah, I think I'll stop there, but if, if I've missed anything, please let me know. Thank you, colleagues. Are you done, uh, Ms. Patel? Um, yes, I think we have. Um, in, in summary, I think everything has been covered. Um, I'm just trying to see in terms of the question around prevention. 
Um, the Federation for Mental Health, you know, uh, one of our key focal areas is around awareness um, and prevention. Um, because I think by, by creating much education and awareness around mental health issues, the idea is to break the stigma uh, around mental health. Um, so we, we are very much involved in prevention. We do uh, promote and encourage that the bill should also focus on prevention services uh, within that conditional grant that is being requested. Um, with regard to the licensing of, um, of, of the uh, health establishments, the licensing guidelines speaks very much to the tertiary health establishments. It doesn't really speak to the needs of those uh, residential care facilities that are managed by community-based organizations. So, you know, it seems very onerous and we need to be able to tailor make it to what is uh, affordable and what is doable for community based organizations to provide community residential care. Um, so we, we therefore have been engaging with National Department of Health uh, around the licensing guidelines. Um, so, so, yeah, that's still in discussion. It hasn't been done. Um, and that is why we have so many unlicensed NGOs um, where we really cannot monitor the care of people. And there's a lot of human rights violations that do take place within those uh, unlicensed facilities. Okay, if there's anything I haven't covered, um, can we get those questions and we will then be able to, to you know, provide those answers in writing? Thank you very much. There's only one follow-up question by Honorable Bihai, but I'm also going to be asked that you brief. We still have a number of other matters we need to deal with. It's a portfolio committee, and even your response to be as brief as possible. Honorable Munyai. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jacobs, our Honorable Chairperson, and also to Patel and the and the product of King's College. I want to say that um, the distribution of budget is not made by any organization, but is made by Minister of Foreign Finance, and we also get equitable distribution. So we would want to have more money and share it more with any organization, but that's hard work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Before you answer, just from myself, is um, a question uh, with regards to your point on traditional health uh, practitioners and healers. Is, uh, the question is, what makes you believe that the traditional healers and practitioners are not covered in the book? Thank you. you may answer those two questions. Sorry, I didn't get that question. Your reference to uh, the traditional uh, healers and practitioners in terms of uh, the traditional health act of 2004 and the general definitions of healthcare providers um, we believe that the traditional uh, practitioners are considered to be part of the category of healthcare providers what is your view on that yes i think what we don't see is that, you know, within the uh, NHI bill, um, NGOs appoint many social workers um, and, and traditional uh, leaders also help, uh, you know, play a role in community-based mental health care. And I think the, the, the request or the recommendation is that traditional leaders be recognized as essential um, staff uh, for mental health care. Does that cover that question? Dr. Jacobs? Sorry, Ms. Patel? Sorry, did you get my answer? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I did. Please continue with Dr. Uh, Mr. Munoz's 
answer that you answer that one. I think he had a statement. He didn't um, ask a question. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming today to present uh, to the Portfolio Committee on Health. We've taken note of everything you presented here. And of course, we also do have your submission, your written submission. We really appreciate you coming. Any last statement from yourself? Uh, just to say thank you very much. It was really an honor to be able to engage with the Portfolio Committee. Um, we will also provide you with a script of the presentation so that you have the detail, um, which was maybe some things that we didn't raise, but we will provide you with the script. And if there's any other questions, please forward. And we look forward to engaging with the committee going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very welcome to leave the platform should you so wish, because we will be doing some other work as a portfolio committee. Thank you very much. Honorable members, we still have a number of things to consider. Firstly, the minutes, which we'd like to complete today, the previous minutes. And then we have some outstanding matters which we need to talk about, including reports and workshops, which are to be planned, as well as um, resumption of the NHI public hearings, which we, in the new year, which we had an agreement to. So uh, please do stay on the platform for us to continue with our work of this morning. And uh, we're hoping to move speedily through those. Um, I think we are, I'm first going to deal with the minutes uh, and get those adopted. And from there onwards, we will move to the other outstanding matters, which I will then raise. And uh, then we will go lastly to the resumption of the NHI public hearing in January. Thank you very much. Ms. Majalamba, if we can just have those minutes uh, fighted and we'll go through them very quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable members. There are the minutes. Please note these were the minutes of the, the public hearings on the uh, NHI bill. It were those are the minutes of the 1st of December. Make certain that you are recorded as being present, should you have been present. On, um, thank you very much. You can just stop there and you will note that those are the presentations by section 27 and uh, treatment action campaign and you these minutes had been forwarded to you so page two anything you would like to add or feel is omitted page three the top part speaks to the same presentation and the uh, the fourth uh, number four there speaks to the presentation by the women's legal center and the sexual reproductive justice coalition anything you would want to raise about those four paragraphs visible on the platform you can scroll and five the table of content and our conclusion nothing can i ask for adoption a mover for adoption of this minute Chairperson, I move for the adoption of the minutes. Thank you very much, Honorable Gela. Any seconder? I second the chair. Thank you very much. These minutes are duly adopted, Honorable Members. We will go for the next set of minutes. These are also uh, the minutes of the 1st of December, but you know these, this, these are the minutes of the meeting. We are very late that same night. And please note whether you are present. It's the, a briefing by the Ministry and the Department of Health on Omicron variant. Please scroll. Anything you want to add on page two? Page three. Yeah, 
things you may correct that uh, page page four very slowly discussions and comments so there were many discussions raised and questions asked continue and the summary of the responses on the next page please continue the report just put in an r there when you page six and then conclusion and adjournment of the meeting honorable members i'm asking for any movers for adoption of these minutes i'll move chairperson Thank you very much. Any seconder? I'm seconding, Chair. Thank you very much. Do we have any other minutes, Ms. Kubane? Uh, uh, no, there are no other minutes, Chair. Thank you. We've adopted all. Thank you all. very much. So, honorable members, that brings me to the last items which we need to discuss. Um, the outstanding issues we had was the processing of the NHI bill and the exemption, which I will take towards the end so that I can complete the others. The second one is the oversight visits and the particular provinces here, um, Pumalanga, Northwest, Eastern Cape, Limpopo, Brazil, and Natal. Then uh, some quarterly reports we need to, which we had dealt with. Uh, and then we've all already had a briefing on the vaccine on the COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout uh, to date. Then the reports to be considered, which had been brought to our attention, and this is uh, not necessarily from the time that uh, we've been a committee. Uh, from 2018 is an investigative report of the Commission for Gender Equality, and it's called the State of Shelters in South Africa. And then from 2018, uh, it's a report which uh, a report which was done in 2018, which we need to consider. Report of the Commission for Gender Equality called Bound by Duty to Care, Assessing Correctional Services Center on the Health and Welfare Services for Female Offenders. Then there's a report of the South African Human Rights Commission on National Investigative Hearing into the Status of Mental Health Care in South Africa. A research report on the Commission for Gender Equality called the Bare Minimum. South Africa's compliance with CDAW Committee 2011, concluding observations and recommendations for 2020. Then a report of the Commission for Gender Equality on an investigation in the choice of termination of pregnancies in South Africa of 2021. A follow up on the CGE's report into for sterilization of women living with HIV AIDS in South Africa. And then we ought to be having two workshops. Uh, before that, the Provincial Department of Health Performance Outcomes for 2020 and 2021. That's one that we raised in particular. And then workshops with the Minister of Health and the Health Ombud. Um, and here we're hoping that the Health Ombud will be bringing the draft bill that he was talking about. Uh, and then a meeting or engagement with the Minister of Health on the Nelson, Dr. Nelson Mandela Fidel Castro Cuban Medical Training Program. You note for yourselves that this is a lot of work that is still outstanding and um, it's work which needs to be completed in terms of a meeting that the chairpersons have had with the leadership of Parliament and that we are under obligation to deal with these matters as soon as possible. Now, as soon as possible from what we see in terms of the program of parliament, it would have to be uh, towards the end of January, early February, we'll have to start engaging with these matters and get, them be get this behind us for the members. This then brings us to the challenge which we're having and we are reminded by the agreement that we've had that we will start earlier than uh, when parliament uh, re resumes on the where the NHI public hearings takes me to the first bullet point there, the processing of the NHI bill and continuation of the NHI public hearings. We have made a proposal for us to restart on the 18th of January uh, 2022, 
with these public hearings, um, we have made a request. We're still waiting for the um, approval of our request, but I am bringing it to you as a committee, um, whether uh, we can agree to that date. And um, yes, and, and those are the matters. That's the date that I am proposing for us to resume with the NHI public hearings. And uh, you are free to now raise any points. I am going to take you probably if you can raise your hands on the platform first, it will really assist instead of everyone shouting. I've seen one now of Honorable Gela. Any other uh, hands? Thank you. Uh, Honorable Gela, please continue. Yes, Chairperson, thank you very much for briefing us uh, for next year's program. Uh, I think we are still uh, left uh, behind. We still have a lot to do regarding the NHI. Uh, I want to support your proposal that let's start early. And I want to support the date that you suggest or you propose that uh, as portfolio committee members, uh, if we can just consider to start early uh, so that at least we continue with the work uh, of NHI. Uh, so, Chairperson, I fully support your proposal of us starting on the 18th uh, with NHI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other hands? Me, Chairperson. On the roof, started. Um, no, it's fine with a date. I don't have a problem. I just want to mention, Chair, if we come back on that date, but we just um, um, talk about the other matters outstanding on that program and that we set the dates for those also so that it's been um, um, ready to go into our diaries and that we don't forget about it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other members? You can even then just speak on this platform, honorable members. I'm done, honorable uh, chairperson. I'm okay. Thank you. So, uh, just to bring come to the matter of honorable Van Staden, the reason why we've not, in particular, put dates down is that we're hoping to complete the NHI public hearings uh, by the end of January bring all those organizations and finish it. Um, we're hoping to take six to seven organizations per day um, and get that spot behind us. And then we'd be able to, at the same time, as we see our progresses, we'd be able to package these other reports and other work that we have put, ourselves, put out for ourselves for next year, that we then start putting uh, dates with, these, uh, with, these, uh, with this work. So I hope that is fine with you on the book and start it. Um, thank you, Chairperson. All right, honorable members, can I get somebody to support Honorable Gela there with me on the proposed date of the 18th of January? I just need to know your agreement because it was a prior agreement that we had. So Chairperson, my hand is up. Chairperson, my hand is up. My hand is up. The 8th of January. Uh, yes, oh, Chairperson. You're welcome, Dr. Tembakwayo. Yes, Chairperson, we also support the, the, the starting on the 18th of January. If there is Thank nothing that will, dis, that will disturb the program, but putting up the dates of other things that the, especially the documents or that we need to engage on we can't be able to can do it today but it can be decided upon on our whatsapp group and so on thank you honorable thank chair you very much. yes honorable, honorable chair. Chair. i want to extend an apology for the for the 8th of january i've been the birthday of the anc Thank you very much. It's 18th, yeah. 1 8th. 18th. Not 8, 1 8th. Am I wrong, Chair? 
Yes, 18th of January. Thank you. I'll support the 18th, Chair. I support Thank you very team. much. I support the 18th, Chair. I, su I support yes. the Honorable Franz Baden on the 18th, Chair. I second. Thank you very much, Honorable Members. I think uh, that brings us almost to a close for today. Apart from wishing all of you a Merry Christmas, a healthy festive season, stay safe, um, get vaccinated, stay off the roads, uh, eat good food, exercise, and come back safely, Honorable Members. That's all I need to say to you as members of the Portfolio Committee. Thank, 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 Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. And also to our staff, all of, all of them who've been yes. helping us so much Merry and so well Christmas for the year. Team, team Health. Sorry, Honorable Munyai. Thank so you to, to the all staff. of our staff, to everyone present, have a wonderful rest. Uh, and we will be communicating with you on the presentations, which will then start on the 18th of January. Thank you very much. Thank you, energetic, hard working. Thank you, many Christmas to everyone. Recording stopped.